The Thief of Always, a fable by Clive Barker, performed by John Glover. The great gray beast February had eaten Harvey Swick alive. Here he was, buried in the belly of that smothering month, wondering if he would ever find his way out through the cold coils that lay between here and Easter. He didn't think much of his chances. More than likely, he'd become so bored as the hours crawled by that one day he'd simply forget to breathe. Then maybe people would get to wondering why such a fine young lad had perished in his prime. It would become a celebrated mystery, which wouldn't be solved until some great detective decided to recreate a day in Harvey's life. Then, and only then, would the grim truth be discovered. The detective would first follow Harvey's route to school every day, trekking through the dismal streets. Then he'd sit at Harvey's desk and listen to the pitiful drone of the history teacher and the science teacher and wonder how the heroic boy had managed to keep his eyes open. And finally, as the wasted day dwindled to dusk, he traced the homeward trek. And as he set foot on the step from which he had departed that morning, and people asked him, as they would, why such a sweet soul as Harvey had died, he would shake his head and say, It's very simple. Oh, the curious crowd would say, do tell. And brushing away a tear, the detective would reply, Harvey Swick was eaten by the great gray beast, February. It was a monstrous month, a dire and dreary month. The pleasures of Christmas were already dimming in Harvey's memory, and the promise of summer was so remote as to be mythical. There'd be a spring break, of course, but how far off was that? Five weeks? Six? He simply knew that long before the sun came to save him, he would have withered away in the belly of the beast. You shouldn't waste your time sitting up here, his mom said when she came in and found him watching the raindrops chase each other down the glass of his bedroom window. Well, I've got nothing better to do, Harvey said. Well, then, you can make yourself useful. You can start by tidying up this room. But don't... Sit wishing the days away, honey. Life's too short. But that's a good boy. And with that, she led him to it. Muttering to himself, he stared around the room. It wasn't even untidy. It looked just fine. I'm ten, he said to himself. Having no brothers and sisters, he talked to himself a good deal. I mean, it's not like I'm a kid. I don't have to tidy up just because she says so. It's boring. He wasn't just muttering now. He was talking out loud. I want to... I want to... He went to the mirror and quizzed it. What do I want? The straw-haired, snub-nosed, brown-eyed boy he saw before him shook his head. I don't know what I want. I just know I'll die if I don't have some fun. I will. I'll die. As he spoke, the window rattled. A gust of wind blew hard against it. Then a second. Then a third. And even though Harvey didn't remember the window being so much as an inch ajar, it was suddenly thrown open. Cold rain spattered his face. Half closing his eyes, he crossed to the window and fumbled to slam it, making sure that the latch was in place this time. When he turned back, the whole room seemed to be swinging around, and standing there in the middle of the room, shaking the rain off his hat, was a stranger. He looked harmless enough. He was no more than six inches taller than Harvey, his frame scrawny, the skin distinctly yellowish in color. He was wearing a fancy suit, a pair of spectacles, and a lavish smile. Who are you? Harvey demanded. Don't be nervous. My name's Rictus. You are Harvey Swick, aren't you? Yes. I thought for a moment I got the wrong house. Harvey couldn't take his eyes off Rictus's grin. It was wide enough to shame a shark with two perfect rows of gleaming teeth. You've got questions, I can see that, Rictus said. Yeah. Ask away, I've got nothing to hide. Well, how did you get in, for one thing? Through the window, of course. It's a long way up from the street. Not if you're flying. Flying? 
Of course. How else was I going to get around on a foul night like this? It was either that or a rowboat. We short folk got to watch out when it's raining this hard. One wrong step and you're swimming. He peered at Harvey quizzically. Do you swim? In the summer, sometimes, Harvey replied. On nights like this, Richter said, doesn't it seem like there'll never be another summer? It sure does, said Harvey. You know, I heard you sighing a mile off, and I said to myself, there's a kid who needs a vacation, if you've got the time, that is. The time? For a trip, boy, for a trip. You need an adventure, young Swick, somewhere out of this world. How'd you hear me sighing when you were a mile away, Harvey wanted to know. Why should you care? I heard you. That's all that matters. Is it magic of some kind? Maybe. Why won't you tell me? Rictus gave Harvey a beady stare. I think you're too inquisitive for your own good. That's why. If you don't want help, that's fine by me. He made a move towards the window. The wind was still gusting against the glass as though eager to come back in and carry its passenger away. Wait, Harvey said. For what? I'm sorry. I won't ask any more questions. Rictus halted, his hand on the latch. No more questions, eh? I promise, said Harvey. I told you. I'm sorry. So you did. So you did. Rictus peered out at the rain. I know a place where the days are always sunny, he said, and the nights are full of wonders. Could you take me there? We said no questions, boy. We agreed. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. Being a forgiving sort, I'll forget you spoke, and I'll see if they've got room for another guest. I'd like that. The wind gusted suddenly and blew the window wide. Watch for me, Rictus yelled above the din of wind and rain. Harvey started to ask if he'd be coming back soon, but stopped himself in the nick of time. No questions, boy, Rictus said, and as he spoke, the wind seemed to fill up his coat. It rose around him like a black balloon, and he was suddenly swept out over the windowsill. Questions rock the mind, he hollered as he went. Keep your mouth shut, and we'll see what comes your way. Harvey said nothing about his peculiar visitor to either his mom or dad. But the trouble with keeping the visit a secret was that after a few days, Harvey began to wonder if he'd imagined the whole thing. Perhaps Rictus had simply been a dream. He kept hoping, nevertheless. Watch for me, Rictus had said, and Harvey did just that. But Rictus didn't show. And then, about a week after that first visit, his watchfulness was rewarded. On his way to school one foggy morning, he heard a voice above his head and looked up to see Rictus floating down from the clouds. How you doing, he said as he descended. I was starting to think I'd invented you, Harvey replied. You know, like a dream. I get that a lot, Rictus said, his smile wider than ever. Particularly from the ladies. You're a dream come true, they say. He winked. So, are you ready? Well, it's no use wasting time, Rictus said. There may not be room for you tomorrow. With that, he turned his back on Harvey. Wait, Harvey protested. I want to come, but, but just for a little while. You can stay as long as you like, Rictus said, or as little. All I want to do is to take that glum expression off your face and put one of these up there. His grin grew even larger. Is there any crime in that? Millsap, the town in which Harvey had lived all his life, wasn't very big, and he thought he'd seen just about all of it over the years. But the streets he knew were soon behind them, and Harvey made sure he kept a mental list of landmarks along the way in case he had to find his way home on his own. How far was this holiday house, he began to wonder. The fog was chilling him, and his legs were aching. If they didn't get there soon, he was going to turn back. I know what you're thinking, said Rictus. You're thinking this is all a trick. You're thinking Rictus is leading you on a mystery tour and there's nothing at the end of it. Isn't that true? Maybe a little. Well, my boy, I've got news for you. Look up ahead. 
He pointed, and there was a high wall so long that it disappeared into the fog to right and left. What do you see? Rictus asked. A wall, Harvey replied, though the more he stared at it, the less certain of this he was. The stones, which had seemed solid enough at first, now looked as though they'd been chiseled from the fog itself and piled up here to keep out prying eyes. It looks like a wall, Harvey said, but it's not a wall. You're very observant. Most people just see a dead end, so they turn around and take another street. But not us. No, not us. We're going to keep on walking. You know why? Because the Holiday House is on the other side? What a miraculous kid you are! That's exactly right! I don't see a gate, Harvey said. That's because there isn't one. So how do we get in? Just keep walking. Harvey did as Rictus instructed, and as he came within three steps of the wall, a gust of balmy, flower-scented wind slipped between the shimmering stones and kissed his cheek. He looked back, but the street with its gray sidewalks and gray clouds had already disappeared. Beneath his feet the grass was high and full of flowers. Above his head the sky was midsummer blue, and ahead of him, set at the summit of a great slope, was a house that had surely been first imagined in a dream. What a fine thing it would be, Harvey thought, to build a place like this. It stood four stories high and boasted more windows than Harvey could readily count. Its porch was wide, as were the steps that led up to its carved front door. Its slated roofs were steep and crowned with magnificent chimneys and lightning rods. Its highest point, however, was neither a chimney nor a lightning rod, but a large and elaborately wrought weather vane, which Harvey was peering up at when he heard the front door open. Harvey Swick, as I live and breathe. He looked down, and there on the porch stood a woman who made his grandmother, the oldest person he knew, look young. She had a face like a rolled-up ball of cobwebs, from which her hair, which could also have been spider's work, fell in wispy abundance. I thought maybe you decided not to come, she said, which would have been a pity. Come on in. There's food on the table. You must be famished. I can't stay long, Harvey said. You must do whatever you wish, came the reply. I'm Mrs. Griffin, by the way. Harvey had climbed the porch steps by now and stopped in front of the open door. This was a moment of decision he knew, though he wasn't quite certain why. Step inside, Mrs. Griffin said, brushing a spider hair back from her furrowed brow. But Harvey still hesitated. Then he heard a boy's voice yelling, I gotcha! I gotcha! Followed by uproarious laughter. Wendell, Mrs. Griffin said, are you chasing the cats again? The sound of laughter grew even louder, and it was so full of good humor that Harvey stepped into the house just so that he could see the face of its owner. A goofy, bespectacled face appeared for a moment at the other end of the hallway. Then a piebald cat dashed between the boy's legs, and he was off after it, yelling and laughing again. He's such a crazy boy, Mrs. Griffin said, but all the cats love him. The house was more wonderful inside than out. Even on the short journey to the kitchen, Harvey glimpsed enough to know that this was a place built for games, chases, and adventures. It was a maze in which no two doors were alike. It's perfect, Harvey murmured to himself. Nothing's perfect, Mrs. Griffin replied. Why not? Because time passes, and the beetle and the worm find their way into everything sooner or later. Hearing this, Harvey wondered what grief Mrs. Griffin had known or seen to make her so mournful. I'm sorry, she said. You came to enjoy yourself, didn't you? I guess I did. So let me tempt you with some treats, said Mrs. Griffin. Harvey sat himself down at the kitchen table, and within sixty seconds Mrs. Griffin had set a dozen plates of food in front of him. Hamburgers, hot dogs, and fried chicken, 
Apple, cherry, and mud pies, ice cream and whipped cream, and a plate of fruits he couldn't even name. He set to eating with gusto and was devouring his second slice of pie when a freckled girl with long, frizzy blonde hair and huge blue-green eyes ambled in. You must be Harvey, she said. How did you know? Wendell told me. How did he know? She shrugged. He just heard. I'm Lulu. Did you just arrive? No. I've been here ages. Longer than Wendell. But not as long as Mrs. Griffin. Nobody's been here as long as she has. Isn't that right? Almost, said Mrs. Griffin. Do you want something to eat, sweetie? Lulu shook her head. No, thanks. I haven't got much of an appetite at the moment. She nevertheless sat down opposite Harvey, stuck her thumb in the mud pie and licked it clean. Who invited you here, she asked. A guy called Rictus. Oh, yeah, the one with the grin. That's him. He's got a sister and two brothers, she went on. You've met them then? Not all of them. They keep themselves to themselves, but you'll meet one or two of them sooner or later. <sighs> well, I guess I'll see you around later, huh? And with that, Lulu ambled away. If you've finished eating, Mrs. Griffin said, I'll show you to your room. She led Harvey up the stairs. At the half landing, basking on the sun drenched window sill, was a cat with fur the color of the cloudless sky. That's Blue Cat, Mrs. Griffin said. You saw Stew Cat playing with Wendell. I don't know where Clue Cat is, but he'll find you. He likes new guests. Do you have a lot of people coming here? Only children. Very special children like you and Lulu and Wendell. Mr. Hood won't have just anybody. Who's Mr. Hood? The man who built the Holiday House. Will I meet him, too? Maybe, but he's a very private man. They were up on the landing by now, and Mrs. Griffin led Harvey to a room at the back of the house. It overlooked an orchard. You look tired, my sweet, Mrs. Griffin said. Maybe you should lie down for a little while. Harvey's eyes closed almost as soon as he put his head on the pillow. The sun came to wake him soon after dawn, and he realized that he'd slept from late afternoon to early morning. The house was more welcoming than ever today. The front door stood open, and sliding down the gleaming banisters, Harvey raced out onto the porch to inspect the morning. A surprise awaited him. The trees, which had been heavy with leaves the previous afternoon, had shed their canopies. There were new tiny buds on every branch and twig, as though this were the first day of spring. Do you like tree houses? said Wendell, ambling around the corner of the house. I never had one. Wendell pointed up at the tallest tree. There was a platform perched up amongst the branches with a rudimentary house built upon it. I've been working up there for weeks, he said, but I can't get it finished alone. You want to help me? Sure, but I've got to eat something first. Go eat. I'll be around. Harvey headed back inside and found Mrs. Griffin setting out a breakfast fit for a prince. There was milk spilt on the floor and a cat with a tail hooked like a question mark lapping at it. Clue cat, he said. Yes, indeed, Mrs. Griffin said. He's the wicked one. Clue cat looked up as if he knew he was being talked about. Can he do whatever he likes, Harvey said, watching the cat sniff at this and that. I, I mean, does nobody control him? Ah, well, we all have somebody watching over us, don't we? Mrs. Griffin replied, whether we like it or not. Now eat. You've got some wonderful times ahead of you. Oh, what a day it was. The breeze was warm and smelt of the green scent of growing things. The perfect sky was full of swooping birds. He sauntered through the grass, calling to Wendell as he approached the trees. Can I come up? If you've got a head for heights. The ladder creaked as Harvey climbed, but he made the platform without missing a step. 
Wendell was impressed. Not bad for a new boy, he said. We had two kids here, couldn't even get halfway up. Where'd they go? Back home, I suppose. Kids come and go, you know. They spent the next two hours working on the treehouse. By noon, they had each found a friend. You're the first kid who's been real fun, Wendell said. What about Lulu? What about her? Isn't she any fun? Uh, she was okay when I first arrived, Wendell admitted. I mean, she's been here months, so she kind of showed me the place. But she's got weird the last few days. I see her sometimes wandering around like she's sleepwalking. She's probably going crazy, Harvey said. Her brain's turning to mush. Do you know about that stuff Wendell wanted to know? Sure I do, Harvey lied. My dad's a surgeon. Wendell was most impressed by this, and for the next few minutes listened in gaping envy as Harvey told him about all the operations he'd seen. All this talk brought on a fierce hunger, and at Wendell's suggestion, they climbed down the ladder and wandered into the house to eat. What do you want to do this afternoon? he asked Harvey as they sat down at the table. It's going to be real hot. It always is. Is there anywhere we can swim? Wendell frowned. Well, yes, there's a lake around the other side of the house, but you won't much like it. Why not? Uh, the water's so deep you can't even see the bottom. Are there any fish? Oh, sure. Maybe we could catch some. Mrs. Griffin could cook them for us. At this, Mrs. Griffin, who was at the stove piling up a plate with onion rings, gave a little shout and dropped the plate. She turned to Harvey, her face ashen. You don't want to do that, she said. Why not? I thought I could do whatever I wanted. Well, yes, of course, but I wouldn't want you to get sick. The fish are, um, poisonous, you see. Oh, said Harvey. Well, maybe we won't eat them after all. <laughs> Look at this mess, Mrs. Griffin said, fussing to cover her confusion. I need a new apron. She hurried away to fetch one, leaving Harvey and Wendell to exchange puzzled looks. Now I really have to see those fish, Harvey said. As he spoke, Clue Cat jumped up onto the counter beside the stove, and before either of the boys could stop him, he had his paws on the lip of one of the pans. Hey, get down, Harvey told him. The cat didn't care to take orders. He hoisted himself up onto the rim of the pan to sniff at its contents, his tail flicking back and forth. The next moment, disaster. The tail danced too close to one of the burners and burst into flames. Clue Cat yowled and tipped over the pan he was perched upon. A wave of boiling water washed him off the top of the stove, and he fell to the ground in a smoking heap. He hit the floor, dead. The din brought Mrs. Griffin hurrying back. I, I think I'm going to go eat outside, Wendell said as the old woman appeared at the door. He snatched up a couple of hot dogs and was gone. Oh, my Lord, Mrs. Griffin cried when she set eyes on the dead cat. Oh, you foolish thing. It was an accident, Harvey said. He, he was up on the stove. You foolish thing. Foolish thing, was all Mrs. Griffin seemed able to say. She sank down on her knees and stared at the sad little sack of burned fur. No more questions from you, she finally murmured. The sight of Mrs. Griffin's unhappiness made Harvey's eyes sting, but he fought back his tears as best he could and said, Shall I help you bury him? That's very sweet of you, Mrs. Griffin said, but there's no need. You go out and play. I don't want to leave you on your own. You're sad. I can see that. What I feel is not quite sadness, and it's not much solace either, I'm afraid. What's solace? Harvey asked. It's something soothing, something that heals the pain in your heart. And you don't have any of that? No, I don't. Mrs. Griffin reached out and touched Harvey's cheek. Except, maybe in these tears of yours, they comfort me. She sighed as she traced their tracks with her fingers. Your tears are sweet, child, and so are you. Now you go out into the light 
and enjoy yourself. There's sun on the step, and it won't be there forever. Believe me. The temperature had risen while Harvey had been at lunch. A heat haze hovered over the lawn, and it made the trees around the house shimmer. He headed towards them, calling Wendell's name as he went. There was no reply. And now a suspicion stole upon him. During the hour he'd spent in the cool of the kitchen, the season had changed. Summer had come to Mr. Hood's holiday house, a summer as magical as the spring that had preceded it. That was why the sky was so faultlessly blue and the birds making so much music. It would not be a long season, Harvey guessed. If the spring had been over in the morning, then most likely this perfect summer would not outlast the afternoon. I'd better make the most of it, he thought, and hurried in search of Wendell. Harvey finally discovered his friend sitting in the shade of the trees, a pile of comics at his side. Want to sit down and read, he asked. Maybe later, said Harvey. First, I want to go and look at this lake you were talking about. Are you going to come? What for? I told you it's no fun. All right, I'll go on my own. You won't stay long, Wendell remarked. As Wendell had predicted, the lake wasn't worth the trouble. It was large, but gloomy and drear, both the lake and the dark stones around it covered with a film of green scum. He was about to leave when a movement in the shadows caught his eye. Somebody was standing further along the bank, almost eclipsed by the thicket. He moved a few paces closer and saw that it was Lulu. She was perched on the slimy stones at the very edge of the water, gazing into the depths. It looks cold, Harvey said. She glanced up at him, then turned and bounded away through the bushes. Wait, Harvey called, hurrying toward the lake. Lulu had already disappeared, however. He might have gone in pursuit of her, but the sound of bubbles breaking in the lake took his gaze to the waters, and there, just below the coating of scum, he saw the fish. They were almost as large as he was, their gray scales stained and encrusted, their bulbous eyes turned up towards the surface like the eyes of prisoners in a watery pit. What a life, he thought. No sun to warm them, no flowers to sniff at or games to play, just the deep, dark waters to circle in and circle and circle and circle. It made him dizzy just watching, and he feared that if he lingered longer, he'd lose his balance and join them. Gasping with relief, he turned his back on the sight and returned into the sunlight. Wendell was still sitting underneath the tree. Well, he said, you were right, Harvey replied. Those fish... Yeah, I know, Wendell said. Ugly boogers, aren't they? Why would Mr. Hood have fish like that? I mean, everything else is so beautiful. The lawns, the house, the orchard. Who cares, said Wendell. I do, said Harvey. I'd like to know how all this works. Is there some kind of machine making the seasons change? Wendell pointed up through the branches of the sun. Does that look mechanical to you? Don't be a dope, Harvey. This is all real. It's magic, but it's real. You think so? It's too hot to think, Wendell replied. Now sit down and shut up. He tossed a few comics in Harvey's direction. Look through these. Find yourself a monster for tonight. What's happening tonight? Halloween, of course. It happens every night. Harvey plunked himself down beside Wendell and began to leaf through the comics, thinking that maybe Wendell was right. However this miraculous place worked, it seemed real enough. What more did he need to know? He must have dozed off because he woke with a start to find that the sun was no longer dappling the ground around him and Wendell was no longer reading at his side. As he got to his feet, the first real breeze he'd felt since noon blew and a leaf its edges sear, spiraled down to land at his feet. Fall, he murmured to himself. By the time he was out from under the trees, he had leaves in his hair and down his back and was kicking them up with every racing step. He raced through the house into the kitchen where Mrs. Griffin was weighing the table down with treats. 
Well, said Wendell as they ate, what are you going to be tonight? Uh, I don't know. Well, what are you going to be? A hangman, he said with a spaghetti grin. I've been learning how to tie nooses. Now all i got to do is find someone to hang. He eyed Mrs. Griffin. It's quick, he said. You just drop them and snap. Their necks break. Oh, that's horrible, Mrs. Griffin said. Why do boys always love talking about ghosts and murders and hangings? Because it's exciting, Wendell said. You're monsters, she replied with a hint of a smile. That's what you are, monsters. Harvey, as Wendell said, I seen him filing down his teeth. <clears throat> Is it a full moon, Harvey said, smearing ketchup around his mouth and putting on a twitch? I hope so. I need blood. Fresh blood. Perhaps the house had heard Harvey wishing for a full moon, because when he and Wendell traipsed upstairs and looked out the landing window, there, hanging between the bare branches of the trees was a moon as wide and as white as a dead man's smile. Look at it, Harvey said. I can see every crater. It's perfect. Well, that's just the start, Wendell promised, and led Harvey to a large, musty room filled with clothes of every description. And half hidden until Wendell cleared the way was a sight that made Harvey gasp. A wall covered from floor to ceiling with masks. Where did they all come from, Harvey said. Now, Mr. Hood collects them, Wendell explained, and the clothes are just stuff that kids who visited here left behind. The masks mesmerized Harvey. They were like snowflakes, no two alike. Some were made of wood and of plastic, some of straw and cloth and paper mache. There were masks of clowns and foxes. Masks like skulls decorated with real teeth, and one with carved flames instead of hair. Take your pick, said Wendell. There's bound to be a vampire somewhere. Harvey decided to leave the pleasure of choosing a mask until last, and concentrated instead on digging up something suitably bat-like to wear. As he worked through the piles of clothes, he found himself wondering about the children who'd left them here. He knew some of the jackets and shoes had been out of fashion for many, many years. Where were their owners now? After a few minutes of searching, he found a long black coat with a collar he could turn up, which Wendell pronounced very vampiric. Well satisfied with his choice, he went back to the wall of faces, and his eyes almost immediately alighted upon a mask with the pallor and deep sockets of a soul just risen from the tomb. He took it down and put it on. It fit perfectly. There was a flickering family of pumpkin heads lined up on the porch when they stepped outside, and the misty air smelt of wood smoke. Where do we go trick-or-treating, Harvey wanted to know. Out in the street? No, said Wendell. It's not Halloween out in the real world, remember? We're going to go round the back of the house. That's not very far. It is at this time of night. The house is full of surprises. You'll see. Harvey looked up at the house through the tiny eye holes of the mask. It loomed as large as a thunderhead, its weather vane sharp enough to stab the stars. Come on, said Wendell. We've got a long trip ahead. A long trip, Harvey thought. How could it be a long trip from the front of the house to the back? But once again, Wendell was right. The house was full of surprises. The trip, which would have been a two-minute walk in the bright afternoon, soon became a trek that had Harvey wishing he brought a flashlight and a map. The leaves rustled underfoot as though snakes were swarming through them. The trees that had shaded them by day now looked frightful in their nakedness, gaunt and hungry. Why am I doing this, he asked himself as he followed Wendell through the darkness. I'm cold. And I'm uncomfortable, he said. He might have added frightened to the list, but he left that thought unsaid. As he was about to suggest they turn back, Wendell pointed up. Look! Harvey looked. Directly overhead, a form was moving silently against the sky. 
Its wings were wide, but ragged. Too ragged to bear it up, he thought. Instead, it seemed to claw at the darkness as it went, as though it were clawing on the very air itself. A glimpse was all Harvey had. Then it was gone. What was that, he whispered. He got no answer. In the moments he'd taken staring up at the sky, Wendell had disappeared. Wendell? Harvey whispered. Where are you? There was still no reply. Just the slithering in the leaves and the moan of hungry branches. I know what you're doing, Harvey said. And you won't scare me that easy. Hear me? He's climbing up into the treehouse, Harvey thought, and determined to catch Wendell and scare him back. He followed the sound. He slipped his mask down around his neck so as to see a little better, but even then he was nearly blind. He could still hear the creaks plainly enough and stumbled in their direction, his arms outstretched to grasp the ladder when he reached it. Now the sound was so loud he was certain he must be standing beneath the tree. He looked up, hoping to catch a glimpse of the trickster, but as he did so, something brushed his face. He snatched at it, but it was gone. Then it came again, brushing his brow from the other side. He snatched at it a second time. Got you, he cried. His yell of triumph was followed by a rush of air and the sound of something crashing to the ground at his side. He jumped, but refused to let go of whatever he was holding. Wendell, he called. By way of reply, a flame flared in the darkness behind him, and a firework erupted into a shower of green sparks. By its flickering light, he saw what he held, and seeing, let out a panicked yammering that had the crows rising from their roosts overhead. It was not a ladder he'd heard creaking. It was a rope. No, not even a rope. A noose. And in his hand... The leg of the man hanging from the noose. He let go of it and stumbled backwards, barely suppressing a second shout as his eyes rose to meet the dead man's stare. A fresh fountain of sparks now burst from the firework, and Harvey saw the truth of the matter. The limb he'd held was a stuffed trouser leg, the body a coat spilling bundles of clothes. That head a mask on a pumpkin with cream for spittle and eggs for eyes. Wendell, he yelled. Wendell was standing on the far side of the firework, his ear-to-ear -ear grin lit by its spitting sparks. He looked like a little demon. I warned you, Wendell said, holding up his mask. I said I was going to be a hangman tonight. I'll get you back for this, Harvey said. I swear, I'll get you back. You can try, Wendell crowed. Had enough for Halloween for tonight? Harvey didn't much like admitting defeat, but he nodded grimly, swearing to himself that when he finally got his revenge, it would be choice. Smile, Wendell said as the fountain of sparks dwindled. We're in the holiday house. All right, Harvey said, allowing himself a tiny smile. There'll be other nights. Always. That's what this place is, Wendell said as the light went out. It's the house of always. Harvey discovered Lulu on the half landing, staring out the window. Wind gusted against the glass, reminding Harvey of Rictus's first visit. It wasn't rain the gusts were bringing, however. It was powdery snow. It'll be Christmas soon, she said. Will it? There'll be presents for everyone. There always are. You should wish for something. Is that what you're doing? No, she said. I've been here so long I've got everything I ever wanted. Would you like to see? Harvey said yes, and she led him up the stairs to her room, which was immense and filled with her treasures. She had several families of dolls who sat in blank-faced rows around the walls. Harvey and Lulu enjoyed each other's company until Harvey caught a glimpse of his reflection in one of the windows and remembered what a sight he was. I'd better go and wash, he told Lulu. I'll see you later. She smiled at him. I like you, Harvey Swick. I like you too, he said. I wouldn't want anything to happen to you. She looked puzzled. 
I saw you at the lake, he said. Did you? I don't remember. Well, anyway, it's deep. You should be careful. You could slip and fall in. I'll be careful, she said as he opened the door. Oh, and Harvey? Yes? Don't forget to wish for something. What shall I ask for, he wondered, as he washed the dirt off his face. Something impossible, maybe, just to see how much magic the house possessed. A white tiger, perhaps? A full-size zeppelin? A ticket to the moon? The answer came from the depths of his memory. He'd wished for a present he'd been given and lost a long time ago, a present that his father had made for him, which Mr. Hood would never be able to duplicate. The Ark, he murmured. With his face washed, he headed back downstairs. A Christmas tree, so tall that the star at its summit pricked the ceiling, stood in the hallway, the colors of its twinkling light seeping into every room. There was a smell of chocolate in the air and the sound of carols being sung. In the living room, Mrs. Griffin was sitting beside a roaring fire with Stew Cat purring on her lap. Wendell's gone outside, she said. There's a scarf and gloves for you by the front door. Harvey went out onto the porch. The wind was icy, but it was already clearing the snow clouds, leaving the stars to shine down on a perfect white carpet. Not quite perfect. A trail of tracks led down from the house to the spot where Wendell was building a snowman. Coming out? He hollered to Harvey. Harvey shook his head. He was so tired, even the snow looked comfortable. Maybe tomorrow, he said. It'll be back tomorrow, won't it? Of course, Wendell yelled, and the night after, and the night after. Harvey went back inside to look at the Christmas tree. Its branches were hung with strings of popcorn and cranberries, with colored lights and baubles and soldiers in gleaming silver uniforms. There's something under there for you, Mrs. Griffin said. I hope it's what you want, sweet. Harvey knelt down and pulled a parcel with his name on it out from under the tree. He pulled at the string. The paper tore and fell away, and there, shiny and new, was a painted wooden ark. It was a perfect copy of the one his father had made. The same yellow hull, the same orange prow, the same lead animals, all in pairs. Two elephants, two camels, two doves, and a dozen more. How did he know, Harvey murmured. Mr. Hood knows every dream in your head, said Mrs. Griffin. But this is perfect, Harvey said in amazement. Look, my dad ran out of blue paint when he was finishing the elephant, so one of them has blue eyes and the other one has green eyes. It's the same. It's exactly the same. He heard Wendell stamping the snow off his feet at the front door and was suddenly embarrassed to have such a childish present in his hands. He gathered it up in its wrapping and hurried away upstairs, intending to head back down for supper. But his bed looked too welcoming to be refused, and instead he lay his head down on his pillow. The Christmas bells were still ringing in some distant steeple, and their repetition lulled him into sleep. That first day in the holiday house, with all its seasons and its spectacles, set the pattern for the many that were to follow. Harvey's only real reminder of the life he'd left was the present he'd wished for, and received that first Christmas, his ark. He'd several times thought of trying it out on the lake, but it wasn't until the afternoon of the seventh day that he got round to doing so. Wendell had made a real glutton of himself at lunch and had declared that it was far too hot to play, so Harvey wandered down to the lake on his own, the ark tucked under his arm. He half expected, hoped, in fact, to find Lulu down there, but the banks of the lake were empty. So he headed down to the shore, found a rock to perch on, and set his ark on the water. It floated well. He pushed it to and fro. As he did so, he caught sight of a fish rising from the bottom of the lake, its mouth wide open, as if it intended to swallow his little vessel whole. He reached out to snatch the ark from the water, but in his haste, 
He lost his footing on the slime-slickened rock, and with a cry he fell into the lake. The water was icy cold and quickly closed over his head. He flailed wildly, trying not to imagine the dark depths beneath him or the fish that had been rising from those depths. Turning his face up towards the surface, he started to swim. He could see his ark floating above him. Its lead passengers were already sinking. He didn't try to save them, but surfaced, gasping for breath, and paddled towards the shore. In less than a minute, he was hauling himself up onto the rocks and scrambling away. Only when his feet were well clear of the lake and no hungry fish could snap at his toes did he drop down onto the ground. Though it was midsummer and the sun was blazing overhead, the air around the lake was cold, and he soon began to shiver. Before he made his way out into the sun, however, he looked for some sign of his ark. The spot where it had sunk was marked by a forlorn flotilla of wreckage. Of the fish that had seemed so eager to devour him, there was no sign. Perhaps it had swum down into the depths to chew on the drowned menagerie. If so, Harvey hoped it choked on its dinner. He'd lost plenty of toys before. He'd had a brand new bicycle, his prized possession stolen from the step of his house two birthdays ago. The idea that the lake now had something that he'd owned was somehow worse. His possessions had gone into a nightmare place, full of monstrous things, and he felt as though a little part of himself had gone with it down into the dark. That very night, Harvey found a piece of colored string with his name tag on it at the base of the Christmas tree and followed it through the house to find a new bike, even more splendid than the one he'd lost two years before, waiting for him. The greatest surprise, however, began with the appearance of one of Rictus's siblings. My name's Jive, he said, stepping out of the early evening murk at the top of the stairs. Every muscle in his body seemed to be in motion. Even his hair, which was a mass of oiled curls, writhed on his scalp in a knotted frenzy. Brother Rictus sent me along to see how you're doing. I'm doing fine, Harvey replied. Did you say Brother Rictus? We're from the same brood, loosely speaking, Jive said. I hope you call your folks now and then. Yep, said Harvey. I called them yesterday. Are they missing you? Didn't sound like it. Are you missing them? Harvey shrugged. Not really, he said. This wasn't strictly true. He had his homesick days. You're going to make the most of being here, then, said Jive. Yeah, I just want to have fun. Who doesn't? Who doesn't? Speaking of fun, you never did get Wendell back for that trick of his. Uh, no, I didn't, said Harvey. Why the heck not? I could never think of a way. Oh, I'm sure we could cook something up between the two of us. It has to be something he'll never think of. That shouldn't be difficult, said Jive. Tell me, what's your favorite monster? A vampire. Harvey said with a grin. I found this great mask. Masks are a good beginning, but vampires need to swoop out of the mist, snatch up their prey, then rise up again, up against the moon. I can see it now. So can I, but I'm not a bat. So? So how do I swoop? Ah, we'll have Mar work on that for us. After all, what's a Halloween without a transformation or two? You go down and tell Wendell we'll meet him outside. I'll go up under the roof and find Mar. You meet us up there. It took Harvey only a minute or two to tell Wendell to go on ahead. With the first part of the plan laid, Harvey hurried upstairs again, found the door, and climbed up onto the roof. Over here, Jive called to him, and Harvey haired off along the narrow walkways and up the steep roof. Sure-footed, Jive observed. No problem. How about flying? said a third voice as its owner stepped from the shadows of a chimney. This is Mar, Jive said, another of our little family. Unlike Jive, who looked nimble enough to walk on the eaves, Mar seemed to have slug blood in her. She was grossly fat, her flesh barely clinging to her bones. She reached out and poked Harvey. I said, 
What about flying? What about it, Harvey said, pushing her hand away. Done much? I flew to Florida once. She doesn't mean in a plane, Jive told him. Oh, in dreams, maybe? Mar said. Oh, yeah, I dream about flying. That's good, Mar replied, grinning with satisfaction. She had not a single tooth in her mouth. You're wondering where they've gone, aren't you? She said to Harvey. Go on. Admit it. Harvey shrugged. Well, yes, I am. Karna took him, the thieving brute. I had fine teeth, beautiful teeth. Who's Karna, Harvey wanted to know. Never mind, Jive said, hushing Mar before she could reply. Get to it or you'll miss the moment. Mar muttered something beneath her breath and said, Come to me, boy, extending her arms in Harvey's direction. Her touch was icy. Feels weird, huh? said Jive as Mar's fingers floated over his face, brushing it here and there. Don't worry, she knows what she's doing. And what's that? Changing you. Into what? You tell her, Jive said. It won't last long, so enjoy it. Go on, tell her about being a vampire. That's what I want Wendell to see, Harvey said. A vampire. Mar said softly, her fingers pressing harder against his skin. Yeah, I, I want to have fangs like a wolf and a red throat and white skin like I've been dead for a thousand years. Two thousand, said Jive. Ten thousand, said Harvey, beginning to enjoy the game. And crazy eyes that can see in the dark and pointy ears like a bat's ears. Wait up. Mar said. I gotta get all this right. Her fingers were working hard upon him now, as though his flesh was clay, and she was molding it. His face was tingling. And there's gotta be fur, Jive observed. Sleek, black fur on his neck. Mar's hands dabbled at his throat, and he felt fur sprouting where she touched him. And the wings, Harvey said. Don't forget the wings. Spread your arms, boy, Mar told him. He did so, and she ran her hands along them, smiling now. It's good, she said. It's good. He looked down at himself. To his astonishment, he found his fingers were gnarled and sharp, and leathery flaps were hanging from his arms. The wind gusted against them, threatening to carry him off the roof there and then. You know you're playing a dangerous game, don't you? Mar said. You'll either break your head or scare the life out of your friend Wendell. Or both. He won't fall, woman, Jive said. He's got the knack of this. I can tell just by looking at him. The wind came gusting again, and if Jive hadn't been holding on to him as they walked the edge of the roof, Harvey would surely have been carried away. There's your friend, Jive whispered, pointing down into the shadows. Much to his amazement, Harvey found that he could see Wendell quite clearly, even though it was pitch dark in the thicket. He could hear him, too, every little breath, every beat of his heart. This is it, Jive hissed, putting his hand on Harvey's back. What do I do, Harvey said. Do I flap or what? Jump, Jive said. The wind will take care of the rest. Either the wind or gravity. And with that, he shoved Harvey off the edge of the roof and into the empty air. The wind wasn't there to bear him up. He plummeted like a slate tossed from the gables, a cry of sheer terror escaping his throat. He saw Wendell turn, saw a look of mortal Fear come onto his face. Then the wind came out of nowhere, cold and strong, and just as his legs brushed the bushes, he felt himself lifted up and up towards the sky. His cry became a whoop, his terror, joy. This was better than any dream, 
flying with the wind in his wings and the world shuddering below in fear of his shadow. He looked for Wendell again and saw him fleeing for the safety of the house. No, you don't, he thought, and turning his wings like leathery sails, he swooped down on his prey. No, don't! Please! Don't! Wendell was sobbing as he ran. Somebody help me! Somebody help me! Harvey knew he'd already had his revenge. Wendell was frightened out of his wits. But it was too much fun to stop now. He liked the feel of the wind beneath him and the cold moon on his back. But most of all, he liked the fear he was causing. The wind was carrying him down into the thicket. And as he landed, Wendell dropped to his knees, begging for mercy. Don't kill me! Please! Please! I beg you! Don't kill me! Harvey had seen and heard enough. He'd had his revenge. It was time to put an end to the game before the fun soured. He opened his mouth to announce himself, but Wendell, seeing the red throat, began a new round of supplications. I'm too fat to eat, he said, but there's another kid around here somewhere. Harvey growled at this. There is, I swear, and there's more meat on him than me. Listen to the child said a voice in the bushes at Harvey's side. He glanced round. There was Jive. He'd see you dead, young Harvey. Wendell heard none of this. He was still advertising the edibility of his friend, hoisting up his shirt and shaking his blubbery belly to prove how unpalatable he was. You don't want me, he sobbed. Take Harvey! Take Harvey! Bite him, said Jive. Go on, drink a little of his blood. Why not? The fat's no good, but the blood's hot. The blood's tasty. He was doing a little dance as he spoke, stamping his feet to the rhythm of his chant. Don't waste the taste. Go eat the meat. And still Wendell whined, all snot and tears. You don't want me. Find Harvey. Find Harvey. And the more he sobbed, the more Jive's chant made sense to Harvey. And yet, what are you waiting for, Jive wanted to know. We've gone to all this trouble to make a monster of you. Yes, but it's a game, Harvey said. A game, said Jive. No, no, boy, it's more than that. It's an education. If you don't pounce soon, you're going to lose him. It was true. Wendell's tears were clearing, and he was staring at his attacker with a puzzled look. Are you gonna let me go? He murmured. Harvey felt Jive's hand in his back. Do it, he said. It's now or never. Then it's never, Harvey said. Never. Wendell fled, yelling at the top of his voice. Harvey didn't give chase. You disappoint me, boy, Jive said. I thought you had the killer instinct. Well, I don't, Harvey said, a little ashamed of himself. He felt like a coward, even though he knew he'd done the right thing. That was a waste of magic, said another voice, and Mar appeared out of the bushes, her arms filled with enormous fungi. Where'd you find those, Jive said. Usual place, Mar replied. She gave Harvey a contemptuous look. I suppose you want your old body back. Yes, please. We should leave him like this, said Jive. He'd get round to sucking blood sooner or later. Nah, said Mar. There's only so much magic to go around. You know that. Why waste it on a miserable little punk like this? She waved her hand casually in Harvey's direction, and he felt the power that had filled his limbs and transformed his face drain out of him. In a matter of moments, he was once again an earthbound boy, wingless and weak. With the spell removed, Mar turned her back on him and waddled off into the darkness. Jive, however, lingered long enough to have one last dig at Harvey. You missed your chance there, kiddo. You could have been one of the greats. 
It was a trick, that's all, Harvey said, concealing the strange unhappiness he felt. A Halloween trick. It meant nothing. There are those who disagree, Jive said. Those who'd say that all the great powers in the world are bloodsuckers and soul-stealers at heart. And we must serve them. All of us. Serve them to our dying day. Harvey found Wendell in the kitchen, a hot dog in one hand and a cookie in the other, telling Mrs. Griffin about what he'd seen. He dropped his food when Harvey came in and yelped with relief. You're alive! You're alive! Of course I'm alive. Why wouldn't I be? There was something out there, a terrible beast. It almost ate me. I thought maybe it had eaten you. Harvey looked down at his hands and legs. Nope, he said. Not a nibble. I'm glad, Wendell said. I'm so, so glad. You're my best friend for always. I was vampire food five minutes ago, Harvey thought. But he said nothing and sat down at the table beside his fair-weather friend to put something sweeter than blood in his belly. Neither Lulu nor Wendell were around the following day, so Harvey was left to his own devices. He tried not to think about what had happened the night before, but he couldn't help himself. All that stuff about soul stealers and how they had to be served, what had that meant? Was it Mr. Hood that Jive had been speaking of? That great power they all had to serve? If Hood was somewhere in the house, why hadn't anyone, Lulu, Wendell, or himself encountered him? If Mr. Hood was indeed here, where was he hiding? And why? So many questions, so few answers. In the late afternoon, lounging in the shade of the treehouse, he heard a yell of frustration and peered through the leaves to see Wendell racing across the lawn. He was dressed in a windbreaker and boots, even though it was swelteringly hot, and he was stomping around like a madman. Harvey shouted to him, but his call went either unheard or ignored, so he climbed down and pursued Wendell around the side of the house. He found him in the orchard, red-faced and sweaty. What's going on, he said. I can't get out, Wendell said. I want to leave, Harvey, but there's no way out. Of course there is. I've been trying for hours and hours, and I tell you the mist keeps sending me back the way I came. Hey, calm down. I want to go home, Harvey. Last night was too much for me. That thing came after my blood. I know you don't believe me. I do. Honest, I do. I've been kidding myself about this place, Wendell said. It's dangerous. Oh, yeah, I know it seems like everything's perfect, but... Harvey interrupted him. Maybe you should keep your voice down. We should talk about this quietly, in private. Like where, said Wendell, wide-eyed. The whole place is watching us and listening to us. Don't you feel it? Why would it do that? I don't know, Wendell snapped. But last night I thought if I don't leave, I'm going to die here. I'll just disappear one night or go crazy like Lulu. We're not the first, you know. What about all the clothes upstairs, all the coats and shoes and hats? They belong to kids like us. Harvey shuddered. Had he played trick-or-treat in a murdered boy's shoes? I want to get out of here, Wendell said, but there's no way out. If there's a way in, there must be a way out, Harvey reasoned. We'll go to the wall. With that, he marched off, Wendell in tow, round to the front of the house and down the gentle slope of the lawn. The mist wall looked perfectly harmless as they approached it. Be careful, Wendell warned. It's got some tricks up its sleeve. Harvey slowed his step, expecting the wall to twitch or even reach for him, but it did nothing. Bolder now, he strode into the mist, fully expecting to emerge on the other side. But by some trick or other, he was turned around without even being aware of it and delivered out of the wall with the house in front of him. What happened, he said to himself. Puzzled, he stepped back into the mist. The same thing occurred. In he went and out he came again. 
Now do you believe me? Wendell said. Yep. So what do we do? Well, we don't yell about it, Harvey whispered. We just get on with the day, pretend we've given up leaving. I'm going to do a little looking around. He began his investigations as soon as they got back into the house by going in search of Lulu. Her bedroom door was closed. He knocked, then called her. There was no reply, so he tried the handle. The door was unlocked. Lulu? It's Harvey. She wasn't there, but he was relieved to see that her bed had been slept in. Have you seen Lulu? he asked Mrs. Griffin when he got downstairs. Not in the last few hours, she replied, but she's been keeping to herself. Mrs. Griffin looked hard at Harvey. I wouldn't pay too much mind if I were you, child. Mr. Hood doesn't like inquisitive guests. I was only wondering where she'd got to, Harvey said. Anyway, I don't believe Mr. Hood exists. Now, you be careful. You don't want to talk about Mr. Hood that way. I've been here days and days, Harvey said, realizing as he spoke that he'd lost count of his time in the house. And I haven't seen him once. Where is he? Please, child, be content with what you know. You're here to enjoy yourself for a little time. And, child, it's such a little time. It flies by. Oh, Lord, how it flies. It's just a few weeks, Harvey said. I'm not going to stay here forever. Or am I? Stop, Mrs. Griffin told him. You think I am here forever? don't you? What is this place, Mrs. Griffin? Is it some kind of prison? She shook her head. Don't tell me lies, he said. It's stupid. We're locked up in here, aren't we? Now, though she was shaking with fear from head to foot, she dared to make a tiny nod of her head. All of us, he said. Again, she nodded. You too? Yes, me too, and there's no way out. Believe me, if you try to escape again, Karna will come after you. Karna? He's up there on the roof. That's where the four of them live. Rictus, Mar, Karna, and Jive. You know, I've met them all but Karna. Pray you never do. Now listen to me, Harvey. I've seen many children come and go through this house. Some of them foolish, some of them selfish, some sweet, some brave. But you, you are one of the brightest souls I have ever set eyes on. I want you to take what joy you can from being here. Use the hours well, because they'll be fewer than you think. Harvey listened patiently to this. Then, when she'd finished, he said, I still want to meet Mr. Hood. Mr. Hood is dead. Dead? You swear? I swear. On the grave of my poor clue cat, I swear. Mr. Hood is dead, so don't ask about him ever again. Well, said Wendell when Harvey came to his room, what's the story? Harvey shrugged. Everything's fine. Why don't we just enjoy ourselves while we can? Enjoy ourselves? How can we enjoy ourselves when we're locked in? It's better in here than it is out in the world, Harvey said. As he spoke, he grabbed hold of Wendell's hand, and Wendell realized there was a ball of paper in Harvey's palm, which he was trying to pass between the two of them. Maybe you should just find a quiet little corner and do some reading, he said, glancing down at their hands. Wendell got the idea. He claimed the balled-up note and said, Maybe I'll do that. 
Good, said Harvey. I'm going to go out and enjoy the sun while I can. That was exactly what he did. He had a lot of planning to do before midnight, which was when the note told Wendell they should meet to make their escape. He knew when he saw Wendell for Halloween that the note had been read and understood. There was a look in Wendell's eye that said, I'm ready. I'm nervous, but I'm ready. The rest of the evening passed like the performance of a strange play in which they were the actors and the house, or whoever haunted it, was the audience. They went about enjoying themselves as though this was a night like any other heading out to play trick-or-treat with a show of loud laughter, then coming in to eat their supper and spend what they hoped would be their last Christmas in the house. They opened their presents, said their good nights to Mrs. Griffin, then went to bed. A little before midnight, he got up and dressed. Then he headed out into the passageway and, slipping like a thief from shadow to shadow, hurried down the stairs and out into the night. He left not by the front door, as it was heavy and creaked loudly, but by the kitchen door, which brought him out at the side of the house. Though the wind had dropped, the air was still bitter, and the surface of the snow had frozen. It crackled as he walked. Just as he was about to turn the corner, somebody in the murk behind him called his name. He froze in his tracks, hoping the darkness would conceal him, but the voice came again, and again called his name. It was not a voice he recognized, not Wendell, certainly, nor Mrs. Griffin. This was a frail voice, the voice of somebody who barely knew how to shape the syllables of his name. Harvey. And then, all of a sudden, he knew the voice. Lulu? Yes? Where are you? Near... He stared at the thicket, hoping for some glimpse of her, but all he could see was the starlight glittering on the frosted leaves. You're leaving, she said. Yes, and you have to come with us. He took a step towards her, and as he did so, some of the glitter that he thought was frost retreated from him. What was she wearing that shimmered this way? Don't be afraid, he said. I don't want you to look at me, she said. What's wrong? Please, just keep your distance. She retreated even further from him and seemed to lose her balance as she did so. She dropped to the ground, the thicket around her shaking. Harvey stepped forward to help her up, but she let out such a sob that he stopped in his tracks. I only want to help, he said. You can't help me. It's too late. You just have to go while you still can. I just wanted to give you something to remember me by. He saw her move in the shadows, reaching out in his direction. Look away, she said. He turned his head away from her. Now close your eyes and promise you won't open them. He dutifully closed his eyes. I promise, he said. And now he heard her moving towards him, her breath laborious. Open your hand, she said. He put out his hand and felt first one then two, then three heavy little objects, cold and wet. This was all I could find, Lulu said. I'm sorry. Can I look, he asked. Not yet. Let me leave first. He closed his fingers around the gifts she'd given him, trying to make sense of them by touch. What were they? Pieces of frozen stone? No, they were carved. He could feel grooves on one, a head on another. And now, of course, he knew what he held. Three survivors of his ark, dredged up from the depths of the lake. 
The answer was no comfort to him. He shuddered as he put the puzzle of Lulu's silvery gleam together with the knowledge of what he held. She had swum down to the bottom of the lake to recover these figures, a descent that was beyond the capacity of any land-dweller. No wonder she'd retreated into the shadows, ordering him not to look at her. She wasn't human any longer. She was becoming, or had already become, a sister to the strange fish that circled in these dark waters, cold-blooded and silver-skinned. Oh, Lulu, he said, how did this happen? Don't waste your time with me, she murmured. Just go while you've a chance. I want to help. You can't, can't help me. I've been here too long. My life is over. That's not true. We're the same age. But I've been here so long, I don't even remember. Don't remember what? Maybe I just don't want to remember, she said. It'll hurt too much. You have to go. Go while you still can. I'm not afraid. Then you're stupid, she said, because you should be. He heard the thicket shake as she started to retreat from him. Wait, he said. Lulu! Breaking his promise, he opened his eyes and caught a glimpse of her as she fled. A shadow in the shadows. No more. He started after her, knowing he'd never forgive himself if he didn't somehow help. Maybe if he persuaded her to go with him out of the shadow of the house, its vicious magic would be undone. Or maybe he could find some doctor for her in the outside world who could cure her. Anything, rather than leaving her to return to the lake. Its waters were in view now, gleaming darkly. Lulu had reached the bank, and for a moment, the meager starlight found her. All that Harvey had feared was true, and more. A fin grew from her bent and scaly back, and her legs had almost fused together. Her arms had become short and stubby, her fingers webbed. But it was her face, glimpsed as she turned back to look at him, that was the greatest shock. Her hair had fallen out and her nose disappeared. Her mouth had lost its lips, and her blue eyes turned to swiveling silver balls, lidless and lashless. And yet, despite their freakishness, there was human feeling in those eyes and on that mouth, a terrible sadness that he knew would never leave his heart if he lived to be a thousand. "'You were my friend,' she said as she teetered on the bank. "'Thank you for that.' Then she tumbled into the water. He went to the edge of the lake at a dash, but the ripples were disappearing. She'd gone where he couldn't follow, and that, it seemed, was the end of it. What happened to you? Wendell whispered when Harvey reached the bottom of the lawn. I thought we were meeting at midnight. I got waylaid, Harvey said. Wendell was obviously nervous enough without being told about Lulu's fate. Harvey slipped the three survivors of the Ark into his pocket and resolved only to speak of the encounter when he and Wendell were safely away from this terrible place. Just one thing stood between them and that ambition, the wall of mist. Now, as ever, it seemed innocent enough, but that was an illusion, of course, like so many things in Mr. Hood's kingdom. We have to be very organized about this, Harvey said to Wendell. Once we're in the wall, we lose our sense of direction. So we have to be sure we keep walking in a straight line and not let the mist turn us around. How do we do that, said Wendell. I think one of us should go in first and the other one hold his hand. Me, said Wendell. I want to be the first. No problem. Then I'll keep my back to the house and keep guiding you. 
Who knows? Maybe the wall's so thin you'll just be able to pull me through. We can hope, Wendell said. Are you ready? Harvey asked, extending his hand. Wendell took it. Whenever you are, he said, then let's get out of here. Wendell nodded and stepped into the mist. Instantly, Harvey felt his grip tighten. Don't let go, Wendell said. Just keep walking, Harvey said, as they reached arm's length. Any sign of... A noise from the house sealed his lips. He glanced back. The front door was open. It was Mrs. Griffin. The noise he'd heard was not from her lips, however. Nothing human could make such a din. He saw Mrs. Griffin glance up toward the roof as she hurried down the lawn and, following her gaze, saw the noisemaker rising against the stars. He knew its name, even though he couldn't see its face. Hood had four servants, and he'd met only three. Rictus, Jive, and Mar. Here was the fourth. Karna, the tooth stealer. Karna, the devourer. Karna, the beast Mrs. Griffin had hoped Harvey would never meet. Back to the house, child, Mrs. Griffin yelled as the din of vast wings filled the air. Quickly! Quickly! Harvey pulled on Wendell's arm, yelling to him as he did so, but Wendell wasn't about to give up. What are you waiting for? Mrs. Griffin yelled. Get away from there, or it'll take off your head! Harvey glanced up at the swooping beast and knew this was no lie. Karna's jaws were wide enough to snap him in half with a single bite. But he couldn't leave Wendell in the mist. He had no choice but to step into the mist himself and hope that Wendell had snatched a glimpse of the world outside and could pull him through to the street. As he took that step, he heard Mrs. Griffin say something about leading the way. Then he was blinded by the chill of the mist and her voice became a garbled whisper. Karna's shrieks were not so hushed, however. They pierced the murk, skewering Harvey's thoughts the way its teeth would skewer his head if the beast caught up with him. Wendell! It's coming for us! He caught a glimpse of a figure up ahead of him, then of Wendell's face smeared by the mist, turning to say, There's no way out! There has to be. I can't find it, Wendell said, his reply almost drowned out by the din of Karna's shrieks. Harvey glanced back the way he'd come. A veil of mist swirled in front of him, but he glimpsed Karna's form as the beast descended. It was the most monstrous of the brood. Its skin rotted and stretched over barbed and polished bone. Its throat a nest of snaky tongues. Its jaws set with hundreds of teeth. This is the end, Harvey thought. I've only been alive ten years and five months, and I'm going to have my head bitten off. Then, from the corner of his eye, a strange sight. Mrs. Griffin's arms reaching into the mist and dropping Blue Cat to the ground. He's got a good sense of direction, Harvey heard her say. Follow him! Follow him! He didn't need a second invitation, nor did Blue Cat. Tail up, it panted off, and Harvey hauled on Wendell's arm to drag him in pursuit. The cat was quick, but so was Harvey. He kept his eyes glued on that bright tail, even when Karna entered the mist and was almost upon them. Two strides, three strides, four, and now the mist seemed to be thinning. He heard Wendell whooping for joy. The street! I see it! And the next moment Harvey saw it too. The sidewalks wet with rain and shining in the lamplight. Now he dared look back, and there was Karna, its jaws a yard from them. He pushed his friend towards the street, ducking as he did so. Karna's lower jaw scraped his spine, but the beast was moving too fast to check itself, and instead of wheeling round to scoop up its quarry, it fled on, out into the real world. Wendell was already there. Harvey joined him a moment later. We did it, Wendell yelled. We did it! 
So did Karna, Harvey said, pointing up at the beast as it rose against the cloudy sky and turned to come back for them. It wants to drive us back inside. I'm not going, Wendell cried. Never. I'm never going in there again. Karna heard his defiance. Its blazing eyes fixed on him, and it came down like a thunderbolt, its shriek echoing through the midnight streets. Run, Harvey said, but Karna's stare had rooted Wendell to the spot. Harvey grabbed hold of him and was about to make a run for it when he heard the beast's cry change. Triumph became doubt. Doubt became pain. And suddenly, Karna was falling, holes opening in its wings. It labored to climb the air again, but seconds later, it struck the street so hard, it bit off a dozen of its tongues and scattered half a hundred teeth at the boy's feet. The fall didn't kill it, however. Though agonized, it hauled itself up onto the spiky crutches of its wings and began to drag itself back towards the wall. Even now, it was ferocious, and with snaps to right and left, drove Harvey and Wendell out of its path. It can't survive out here, Wendell realized aloud. It's dying. Then the creature was gone, a curtain of mist drawn over its retreat. Weird, said Wendell as he stared at the rainy streets. It's as though I never left. Is it? said Harvey. He wasn't so sure. He felt different, marked by this adventure. I wonder if we'll even remember we came here in a week's time. Oh, I'll remember, Harvey said. I've got a few souvenirs. He dug into his pocket in search of the figures from the ark. Even as he pulled them out, he felt them crumbling as the real world took its toll on them. Illusions, he murmured, as they turned to dust and ran between his fingers. Who cares, said Wendell. It's time to go home, and that's no illusion. It took the boys an hour to reach the center of town, and there, given that their houses lay in opposite directions, they exchanged addresses. It was still several hours before daybreak, and the streets were virtually deserted. So for Harvey, it was a long, lonely trudge home. As the east began to pale, and the birds in the street started their twitterings, he rounded the corner of his street. His weary legs broke into a joyful dash and brought him to the step, ready to fall into his parents' arms. He knocked on the door. There was no sound from the house at first, which didn't surprise him given the hour. He knocked again and again. Finally, a light was turned on, and he heard somebody coming to the door. Who is it? said his father from behind the closed door. Do you know what time it is? It's me, said Harvey. Then came the sound of bolts being drawn aside, and the door was opened a crack. Who's me, said the man, peering out at him. He looked kindly enough, Harvey thought, but it wasn't his father. This was a much older man, his hair almost white. What do you want, he said. Before Harvey could reply, a woman's voice said, Come away from the door. He couldn't see the second speaker yet, but he caught a glimpse of the wallpaper in the hallway and the pictures on the wall. To his relief, he saw that this was not his house at all. He'd obviously made a mistake and knocked on the wrong door. I I'm sorry, he said, backing away. I didn't mean to wake you up. Who are you looking for, the man wanted to know, opening the door a little wider now. Are you one of the Smith kids? He started to dig in the pocket of his dressing gown and brought out a pair of spectacles. He can't even see me properly, Harvey thought, poor old man. But before the spectacles reached the bridge of the man's nose, his wife appeared behind him, and Harvey's legs almost folded up beneath him. She was old, this woman, her hair almost as colorless as her husband's, and her face even more lined and sorrowful. But Harvey knew that face better than any on earth. Mom? The woman stopped and stared out through the open door at the boy standing on the step, her eyes filling with tears. Harvey! Mom! Mom! 
It is you, isn't it? By now the man had put on his spectacles and peered through them with his eyes wide. It's not possible, he said flatly. This can't be Harvey. It's him, said his wife. It's our Harvey. He's come home. The man shook his head. After all these years, he'd be a man by now. He'd be a grown man. This is just a boy. It's him, I tell you. No, it's some prank. Somebody trying to break our hearts, as if they're not broken enough. He started to slam the door, but Harvey's mom caught hold of it. Look at him, she said. Look at his clothes. That's what he was wearing the night he left us. How do you know? You think I don't remember? It's 31 years ago, said Harvey's father. This can't... can't... be... Oh, my Lord. It is him, isn't it? Are you some kind of ghost? Oh, for goodness sake, Harvey's mom said. He's no ghost. She slipped past her husband. I don't know how it's possible, and I don't care, she said, opening her arms to Harvey. All I know is our little boys come home to us. Harvey couldn't speak. There were too many tears in his throat and in his nose and in his eyes. All he could do was stumble into his mother's arms. Oh, Harvey, 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 she sobbed. We thought we'd never see you again. She kissed him over and over. We thought you'd gone forever. How is this possible? His father still wanted to know. I kept praying, his mother said. Harvey had another answer, though he didn't voice it. The moment he'd set eyes on his mother, so changed, so sorrowful, it was instantly clear what a terrible trick Hood's house had played upon them all. For every day he'd spent there, a year had gone by in the real world. And though he'd only aged a month, his mom and dad had lived in sadness for 31 years, thinking that their little boy had gone forever. That had almost been the case. If he'd remained in the House of Illusions, distracted by its petty pleasures, a whole lifetime would have gone by here in the real world, and his soul would have become Hood's property. He would have joined the fish circling in the lake, and circling, and circling. He shuddered at the thought. You're cold, sweetie, his mother said. Let's get you inside. I'm so tired, he said. I'll make a bed for you straight away. No, I want to tell you what happened before I go to sleep. It's a long story. Thirty-one years long. It was a more difficult tale to tell than he expected it to be. It was as though the mist he'd strode through had drawn a veil over the house and much of what it contained. I remember speaking to you on the phone, he said. You didn't speak to us, honey, his mom replied. Then that was just another trick, Harvey said. I should have known. But who was playing all those tricks, his father demanded. If this house exists, I say if, then whoever owns it kidnapped you and somehow kept you from growing up. Maybe he froze you. No, said Harvey. It was warm there, except when the snow came down, of course. There has to be some sane explanation. Could you find this house again? Yes, Harvey replied. I think so. Then that's what we'll do. In the early afternoon, as he slept in his old room, it rained. A hard March rain that beat against the window and slapped on the sill. The sound woke him. He sat up in bed with the hairs at his nape pricking and knew that he'd been dreaming of Lulu. The thought of her unhappiness was unbearable. How could he ever hope to live in the world to which he'd returned, knowing that she remained Hood's prisoner? I'll find you, he murmured to himself. I will. I swear. Then he lay back on the cold pillow and listened to the sound of rain until sleep crept over him. 
Exhausted, he didn't wake again until the following morning. The rain had cleared. It was time to lay plans. I bought a map of the whole of Millsap, his father said, unfolding his purchase and spreading it over the kitchen table. Now, do you remember any of the street names around Hood's place? Harvey shook his head. I was too busy escaping, he said. Were there any particular buildings you saw? It was dark and rainy. So we just have to trust to luck. We'll find it, Harvey said, even if it takes all week. It was easier said than done. More than three decades had passed since he'd first made his way through the town with Rictus, and countless things had changed. I don't know which way is which, Harvey admitted. We'll keep going, his father said. It'll all come clear. It didn't. They spent the rest of the day wandering around, hoping that some sight would trigger a memory, but it was a frustrating business. The following day, he was sitting at his bedroom window, trying to puzzle the problem out, when he saw a forlorn figure at the street corner. He threw open the window and yelled, Wendell! Wendell! Over here! Then he raced downstairs. What happened? Wendell said. Everything's changed. My dad divorced my mom, and my mom's so old, Harvey, and fat as a house. It wasn't supposed to be this way. Well, was it? Harvey did his best to explain how the house had deceived them, but Wendell was in no mood for theory. He just wanted the nightmare to be over. I want things the way they were, he wailed. My dad's gone to the police, Harvey said. He's going to tell them everything. That won't do any good, Wendell said. They'll never find the house. You're right. I went to look for it with my mom and dad, but it was no use. It's hiding. Well, it's bound to hide from them, stupid. It doesn't want grown-ups. You're right, said Harvey. I don't think any of those grown-ups, my dad, your mom, the police, are ever going to find the house. If we want all those years back, we have to get them for ourselves. It was as if the house knew they were coming back and was calling to them. As soon as they stepped out into the street, their feet seemed to know the way. All they had to do was let them lead. Harvey, look! Wendell pointed ahead of them. Harvey knew the street at a glance. This is it, he said. It was strange, but he didn't feel afraid, even though he knew they were walking back into their enemy's arms. It was better to face Hood and his illusions now than spend the rest of his life wondering about Lulu and mourning the years he'd lost. Are you ready? he asked Wendell. Before we go, his friend replied, can we just get one thing straight? If the house is all illusions, then how come we felt the cold? How come I got fat from eating Mrs. Griffin's pies? And I don't know, Harvey cut in. I can't explain how Hood's magic works. All I know is he took all those years away to feed himself. Feed? Yeah, like... like a vampire. This was the first time Harvey had thought of Hood that way, but it instinctively seemed right. Blood was life, and life was what Hood fed upon. He was a vampire, sure enough. Maybe a king amongst vampires. Wendell followed on his heels, and just as Harvey stepped into the wall, he snatched hold of his friend's sleeve so that they entered as they had exited, together. It was high summer in Hood's kingdom, the lazy season. The sun, which had been hidden by rain clouds on the other side of the mist, was beaming down on the house. The trees swayed in a balmy breeze. The doors and windows gleamed as if newly painted. There were welcoming songs in the eaves, welcoming smells from the kitchen, welcoming laughter through the open door. I'd forgotten, Wendell murmured. Forgotten what? How beautiful it is. Don't trust it, Harvey said. It's all an illusion, remember? Wendell didn't reply, but wandered away towards the trees. Wendell, Harvey said, following him across the lawn. We've got to stick together. I'd forgotten about the treehouse, Wendell said. We had such fun up there, remember? 
No, said Harvey. I don't remember. Yes, you do, said Wendell. We worked so hard up there, I'm going to see how it looks. No, you're not. Yes, I am. I can do whatever I want. You don't own me. Harvey could see by the glazed look in Wendell's eyes that the house was already working its seductive magic. No, he said. I'm not going to let you do it. Do what, said Wendell. We've got work to do. Who cares? I do. And so did you five minutes ago. Remember what it did to us, Wendell? Of course I do. We said we were going to... Going to... This place has stolen time that belonged to us, Wendell. How'd it do that? It's just... Just... Just such a perfect day. I mean, on a day like this, who cares? Let's just enjoy ourselves. Harvey shook his head. He was losing precious time here, which was exactly what Hood and the house wanted. Instead of wasting any further words on Wendell, he turned on his heel and headed towards the front door. Wait for me, Wendell hollered. Can you smell that pie? Harvey could, and he wished he'd put some food in his belly before he started out on this adventure. Knowing that these tantalizing smells were all part of Hood's repertoire wasn't enough to stop his mouth from watering or his stomach from grumbling. With Wendell again trailing a step behind, he climbed the porch steps and marched into the house. The moment they were both inside, the door slammed behind them. Harvey reeled around, his skin crawling. It was not the wind that had thrown the door shut. It was Rictus. Great to have you back, boy, Rictus said, his smile as wide as ever. I told everyone you wouldn't be able to stay away. Nobody believed me. He's gone, they said. He's gone, but I knew better. I knew you wouldn't be satisfied with a little visit, not with so much fun still to be had. I'm hungry, Wendell whined. Help yourselves, Rictus grinned. Wendell was off at a sprint into the kitchen. Oh, boy, oh, boy, oh, boy, he hollered. Look at all this food. Harvey didn't reply. Aren't you hungry, Rictus said, raising an eyebrow high. He cupped his hand behind his ear. That sounds like an empty belly to me. Where's Mrs. Griffin, Harvey said. She's around, but she's getting old. She takes to her bed a good deal these days, so we laid her down somewhere safe and sound. As he spoke, there was a mewing sound from the living room, and there at the door stood Stewcat. Rictus scowled. Get out of here, pussy! Can't you see we're having a conversation? But Stewcat wasn't about to be intimidated. She sauntered over to Harvey, rubbing herself against his legs. What do you want, Harvey said, stroking her. She purred loudly. Hey, that's fine and dandy, Rictus said. You like the cat? The cat likes you? Everybody's happy. I'm not happy, Harvey said. And why's that? I left all my presents here, and I don't know where. No problem, said Rictus. I'll find them for you. Would you do that? Sure, kid. That's what we're all here for, to give you whatever your heart desires. I think maybe I left them up in my bedroom, Harvey suggested. You know, I think I saw them up there, Rictus replied. You stay right here. I'll be back. He took himself up the stairs two and three at a time. Harvey waited until he disappeared from sight, then went to check on Wendell, letting Stewcat slip away. Ah, now, look at this, a voice said at the kitchen door. It was Jive. He was standing at the stove as sinewy as ever, juggling eggs with one hand and tossing pancakes in a pan with the other. What do you fancy, he said, sweet or savory? Nothing, Harvey said. It's all good, Wendell piped up. He was almost hidden behind a wall of filled plates. The buffet looked wonderfully tempting, but it was dust. Harvey had to keep remembering that. Maybe later, he said, averting his eyes from the heaps of syrup-drenched waffles and bowls of ice cream. Where are you going? Jive wanted to know. 
Um, Rick just is finding new presents for me, Harvey said. Jive smiled. So, you're getting back into the swing of things, kiddo. Good for you. I've missed being here, Harvey replied. He didn't linger just in case Jive saw the lie in his eyes, but turned and headed back into the hallway. Stewcat was still there, staring at him. What is it, Harvey said. The cat took off towards the stairs, then stopped and cast a backward glance. Have you something to show me? At this, the cat led Harvey down a narrow passage to a door he had never even noticed before. He rattled the handle, but the door was locked. Turning to look for Stew Cat, he found her rubbing her arched back against the leg of a small table nearby. On the table was a carved wooden box. In the box was a key. He went back to the door, unlocked it, and pulled it open. There was a flight of wooden steps in front of him, leading down into a darkness from which a sour, dank smell rose. Stew Cat hurried past him down into the murk. With his fingers trailing on the damp walls to left and right, Harvey followed Stew Cat to the bottom of the flight. The cellar was cavernous, but empty, except for a litter of rubble and a large wooden box which lay in the dust maybe a dozen yards from where he stood. What is it? he hissed to Stew Cat. Stew Cat's answer was to run across the floor and leap nimbly onto the box, where it began to claw at the wood. Harvey's curiosity was stronger than his fear, but not so much stronger that he dashed to pull off the lid. The closer to it he got, the more it resembled a crude coffin. But what kind of coffin was sealed with a padlock? Was this where Karna had been laid after the beast had dragged its wounded body back home? As he came within a yard of the casket, however, he laid eyes on a clue to its contents, an apron string hanging out of the box. He knew of only one person in the house who wore an apron. Mrs. Griffin! Mrs. Griffin! Are you in there? There was a muffled thump from inside. I'm going to get you out, he promised, hauling on the lid as hard as he could. He didn't have the strength to break the lock. In desperation, he began to search the cellar, looking for some tool or other, and found himself two sizable rocks. Hefting them, he returned to the casket. This is going to be noisy, he warned Mrs. Griffin. Then, using one stone as a kind of chisel and the other as a hammer, he assaulted the lock. Blue sparks flew as he struck at the metal. All of a sudden, the lock gave a loud crack and fell to the ground. He paused for a moment, a feather of doubt brushing his brow. Suppose it was Karna's coffin. Then he threw the rocks aside and hauled off the lid. Poor Mrs. Griffin was staring up at him with wild eyes. Her hair pulled out in clawfuls, her face purple with bruises. A foul rag had been stuffed in her mouth. Harvey carefully removed it. Thank you, my sweet, thank you. But, oh, you shouldn't have come back. It's too dangerous here. Who did this to you? Jive and Rictus. But he ordered it, didn't he, Harvey said, helping her up. Don't tell me he's dead, because I know that doesn't matter. Hood's here in this house, isn't he? Yes. Yes, he's here, but not in the way you think. She began to weep. It's all right, Harvey said. Everything's going to be all right. Her fingers went up to her face and touched the tears. I thought... I thought I'd never cry again, she said. Look what you've done. I'm sorry, Harvey said. Oh, no, my sweet, don't be sorry. It's wonderful. You've broken his curse on me. What curse? I want to hear. I was the first child who ever came to Hood's house, she said. This was many, many years ago. I was nine when I first walked up the front path. I'd run away from home, you see. Why? My cat 
had died and my father refused to buy me another. And what do you think Rictus gave me the very day I arrived? Three cats. You know how this house works, don't you? It gives you whatever you think you want. And I wanted cats. And a home. And... What? Another father. I met Hood that night. At least I... I heard his voice. Where did you hear him? In the attic at the top of the house. And he said to me, If you stay here... Forever and ever, you'll never die. You'll grow old, but you'll live until the end of time and never weep again. And that's what you wanted? It was stupid, but yes, I did. I was afraid, you see, afraid of being put into the ground like my cat. I was running away from death. Straight into its house, Harvey said. Oh, no, child. Hood isn't death. Death is a natural thing. Hood isn't. I would welcome death now. Like a friend, I've driven away from my door. I've seen too much, my sweet. Too many seasons, too many children. Why didn't you try and stop him? I have no power against him. All I could do was give the children who came here as much happiness as I knew how. So how old are you? Harvey asked. Who knows, she replied. I grew up and old in a matter of days, but then the passage of time seemed to lose its hold on me. Sometimes I've wanted to ask one of the children, what year is it in the world outside? I can tell you, don't. I don't want to know how the years have flown. It would hurt too much. What do you want, then? To die to slip out of this skin and go to the stars. Is that what happens? It's what I believe. But Hood won't let me die. Not ever. That'll be his revenge on me for helping you to escape. He already had Blue Cat murdered for showing you the way out. Hood's going to let you go, Harvey said. I promise I'm going to make him. You're brave, my sweet, but he won't let any of us go. There is such a terrible emptiness inside him. He wants to fill it with souls. But it's a pit, a bottomless pit. And you're both heading for it, said an oily voice. The speaker was Mar. She was oozing down the stairs. We've been looking for you. Up and down, she said to Harvey. You'd better come with me, child. She extended her arms in Harvey's direction. He remembered all too well her transforming touch. Come, come, she said. I might still get you out of trouble if you let me make something humble of you. He likes humble things, does Mr. Hood? Fleas, worms, scabby dogs. Come to me, child, quickly. Harvey looked around the cellar. There was no other way out. If he was to get Mrs. Griffin up into the sun, it had to be by way of the stairs, and Mar was standing in front of them. He took a step in her direction. She smiled toothlessly. Good, child. Good, she said. Don't. She'll hurt you. Hush, woman, Mar said. We're going to have to nail that lid down next time. Her greasy green eyes swiveled back in Harvey's direction. He knows what's good for him, don't you? 
boy. Harvey didn't reply. He simply kept walking towards Mar, whose fingers seemed to be growing like a snail's horns, reaching out for his face. You've been such an obedient boy. Maybe I won't turn you into a worm after all. What would you like to be? Tell me. Tell me what's in your heart. Never mind my heart, Harvey said. What about yours? A puzzled look came over Mar's face. Mine, she said. Yes. What do you dream of being? I never dream. You should try it. If you can change me into a worm or a bat, what could you do for yourself? The defiance on her face turned into panic. Her outstretched fingers began to retreat. Harvey reached for them like lightning, interweaving his fingers with hers. What do you want to be, he said. Think. She started to struggle, and he felt her magic surging through her fingers, attempting to work some change on him. But he didn't want to be a vampire bat anymore, and he certainly didn't want to be a worm. He was quite happy to be himself. The magic, therefore, had no hold on him. Instead, it flowed back into Mar, who began to shake. What are you doing? she demanded. Tell me what's in your heart, he said. I'm not telling you, she replied, still trying to wrest her fingers free of his. But she was not used to having her victims resist her this way. Her muscles were soft and flabby. Leave me alone, she said. If you harm me, Mr. Hood will have your head. I'm not harming you. I'm just letting you have your dreams, the way you let me have mine. I don't want them, she yelled, struggling more than ever. He wouldn't let her go. No, she began to murmur. No, but she couldn't keep the magic she intended for him from working on her own skin and bones. Her fat face began to soften and run like melting wax. Her body sagged in its ragged coat, and a greenish gruel began to pour out onto the floor. Oh, oh she sobbed. You damnable child! What dream was this, Harvey wondered, that was turning Mar to mush? What do you dream about, Harvey said, as Mar's fingers ran away between his own like brackish water. I dream of nothing, Mar replied, her eyes sinking back into her disintegrating skull. And that's what I've become. She was almost lost in the folds of her clothing. Nothing. She said, then she was gone, devoured by her own magic. You did it, child. You did it. One down, three to go, Harvey said. Be careful, child. I will, he told her, then close the door. You're a strange one, Rictus said, his smile failing a little. I could suck out your brains through your ears. Maybe you could, but you're not going to. How do you know? Because I've got an appointment with your master. He started towards the bottom of the stairs, but before he reached it, a dark figure flitted in front of him. It was Jive, carrying a plate of apple pie and ice cream. It's a long climb, he said. Put something in your stomach first. Harvey looked down at the plate. The pie was golden brown and dusted with sugar, the ice cream melting. It certainly looked tempting. Go on, said Jive. You deserve a treat. No thanks. Why not? It's lighter than I am. But I know what it's made of, Harvey said. I know what it's really made of. You think it's poison, Jive said. Is that it? Maybe. Well, it's not, and I'll prove it. 
Harvey heard Rictus make a warning sound behind him, but Jive didn't catch it. He plunged his fingers into the pie and ice cream and delivered them to his mouth in one swift motion. Don't swallow it, Rictus said. Again, too late. The food went down in one gulp. An instant later, Jive dropped the plate and began to slam his fists against his stomach, as if to bully the food up. But instead of half-chewed pie, a cloud of dust issued from between his teeth. Then another. Then another. Half-blinded, Jive snatched at Harvey's throat. What have you done? Harvey had no difficulty shaking himself free. It's all dust, he said. Dirt and dust and ashes. All the food, all the presents, everything. Help me, Jive said, clawing in his mouth. Somebody help me. There's no help for you now. Harvey looked around. It was Rictus who had spoken, and he was retreating across the hallway. He stared at Jive, his teeth chattering as he voiced the horrid truth. You shouldn't have eaten that pie, he said. It's reminding your belly what you're made of. What's that? Jive said. What the boy says. Dirt and ashes. Jive threw back his head, howling. No! He started to drop to the ground, but with a final pirouette, swung himself around and grabbed hold of the banister. Save me, he yelled up the stairs. His legs crumbled beneath him now, but he refused to give up. He started to haul himself up the stairs, still yelling for Mr. Hood. There was no reply from the heights of the house, nor any sound now from Rictus. There was only Jive's pleas and the hiss of dust as it ran away down the stairs from the emptying sack of his body. What's going on? Wendell said, appearing from the kitchen. He stared at the cloud of dust that hung around the stairs, unable to see the creature at its heart. Somebody been beating the carpets, he said, as Jive's dust settled. Two down, Harvey murmured to himself. What'd you say? Before he replied, Harvey glanced around the hallway looking for Rictus. But Hood's third servant had disappeared. It doesn't matter, Harvey said. Are you done eating? Yeah. Was the pie good? Yeah. Harvey shook his head. What does that mean? Wendell wanted to know. Harvey was on the verge of saying, It means you can't help me. It means I have to face Mr. Hood on my own. But what was the use? The house had claimed Wendell entirely. Mrs. Griffin's outside, Harvey said. We found her. I'll go say hi, Wendell said. Where will you be? But Harvey didn't answer. He'd already climbed past the heap of dust that marked Jive's demise on his way to meet the power that lay waiting in the darkness of the attic. Harvey climbed the stairs. There were five doors ahead of him, every one of them ajar a few inches, as if to say, there are no secrets here, not from a boy who wants the truth. Come look, come see, if you dare. He dared, but not in the way the house had planned. After examining the doors, he went back down a flight, chose a strong chair from one of the bedrooms, brought it back upstairs, climbed onto it, and pushed open the trap door to the attic. It was hard work hauling himself up, but he knew when he'd finished and lay panting on the attic floor that the Vampire King was near. Who else but a master of illusions would live in a place so bereft of them? The attic was all the house was not, filthy, murky, and cobwebbed. Where are you? Harvey said. Come out. I want to see what a thief looks like. There was no reply at first, and then, from somewhere at the other end of the attic, Harvey heard a low, guttural growl. He started towards the utterance, the boards creaking beneath his feet as he went. Unlike the area around the trap door, this end of the attic served as some kind of storeroom and his enemy was surely lurking in the maze of rotting pictures and mildewed furniture. In fact, wasn't that a fluttering motion he saw now out of the corner of his eye? Hood, he said, squinting to try and make better sense of the shape in the shadows. What are you doing hiding up here? He took another step forward, and as he did so, he realized his error. This wasn't the mysterious Mr. Hood. He knew this shape, mangled though it was, the half-rotted wings, the tiny black eyes, the teeth, 
the endless teeth. It was Karna. The creature half rose, snapping at Harvey. He made a stumbling retreat and might have been seized had Karna not been so hobbled by its wounds. It struck out at the piles of detritus to left and right of it, scattering chairs and overturning boxes, then hauled itself in pain pursuit of its prey. Harvey kept his eyes fixed upon the beast as he backed away, his mind buzzing with questions. Where was Hood? He chanced several glances into the shadows as he retreated in case he'd missed some figures hiding there. It was not a human form his eyes alighted upon, however. It was a globe the size of a tennis ball, glowing as though filled with starlight that appeared like a bubble from the boards and rose towards the roof. Harvey watched as it ascended, joined by another, then a third, and a fourth. Astonished by the sight, he took too little care where he was walking. He stumbled and sprawled on the hard board, staring up at the roof. And there above him was Hood, in all his glory. His face was spread over the entire roof, his features horribly distorted. His eyes were dark pits gouged into the timbers. His nose was flared and flattened grotesquely, like the nose of an enormous bat. His mouth was a lipless slit that was surely ten feet wide. Child, you have brought pain into my paradise. Shame on you. What pain, Harvey shouted back. He was shuddering to his marrow, but he knew this was no time to show fear. He would deal in illusion the way that the enemy did. Pretend courage, even if he didn't feel it. I came to get what was mine, that's all. Hood sucked one of the gleaming spheres into his mouth. Its light went out instantly. Mar is dead. Jive is dead. Gone to muck and dust because of you. They were never alive, Harvey said. Did you not hear their sobs and pleas? Did you not pity them? No. Then I will not pity you. I will watch my poor Karna devour you from soul to scalp and take pleasure in it. Harvey glanced in Karna's direction. The beast had stopped advancing but was poised to strike, its dripping jaws inches from Harvey's feet. Now that the beast was still, he could clearly see how badly wounded it was, its body as ragged as a moldy rug. Such a pity. What is... Harvey said, looking back at Hood, who had two more of the globes at its lips. To lose you this way, can't I persuade you to think again? After all, I've done you no harm. Why not come back and live here peacefully? You stole 30 years of time with my mom and dad from me. If I stay here, you'll steal a lot more. I only took the days you didn't want. The rainy days, the gray days, the days you wished away. Where's the crime in that? I didn't know what I was losing. Ah, but isn't that always the way of it? Things slip from your fingers and when they're gone, you regret it. But gone is gone, Harvey Swick. No, what you stole I can steal back. At this, a gleam ignited in the twin pits of Hood's eyes. You burn bright, Harvey Swick. I've never known a soul that burned as bright as yours. Now I understand. Understand what? Why it is you came back. You came because you knew you'd find a home here. We're both Thieves, Harvey Swick. I take time. You take lives. But in the end, we're the same. Both thieves of always. Repulsive as it was to think of himself in any way similar to this monster, there was some corner of Harvey that feared this was true. The thought silenced him. Perhaps we needn't be enemies. Perhaps I should take you under my wing. My west wing. He laughed 
mirthlessly at his own joke. I can nurture you, help you better understand the dark paths. So I'll end up feeding on children like you. No thanks. I think you'd like it, Harvey Swick. You've got a streak of the vampire in you already. I don't want to stay here, Harvey said. I just want to get what's mine and leave. So sad. So very sad. But if you will have what's yours, have death. Karna, devour the boy. Before the wretched beast could shift itself, Harvey scrambled to his feet. In the race to the trap door, he knew he had little chance of outrunning Karna, but was there perhaps another way of laying the beast low? Karna took a threatening step towards him, but instead of retreating, he extended his hand in the creature's direction as if to pat its decaying head. It hesitated, its expression mellowing into doubt. Devour him! The beast lowered its head in expectation of punishment from above. But it was Harvey who laid his hand upon it, a gentle touch that sent a shudder through its body. It raised its snout to press itself against Harvey's palm, and as it did so, let out a long, low moan. It was almost a moan of gratitude that for once it not be met with blows or howls of horror. It turned its eyes up to Harvey's face, and a shudder of pleasure passed through its body. It seemed to know that the motion would prove fatal, because the instant after, it flew into a thousand pieces. Harvey glanced up at the face in the roof. Hood's expression was one of utter perplexity. His mouth was agape, his eyes were staring from their pits. Harvey didn't wait for him to break his silence. He simply turned his back on Karna's remains and began towards the trap door, half expecting the creature in the roof to slam it shut. There was no response from Hood, however, until Harvey was lowering himself down onto the chair on the landing. Only then, as Harvey took one last look up at the attic, did Hood speak. Oh, my little thief, what shall we do with you now? You've done well, said the smiling face at the top of the stairs. I wonder where you got to, Harvey said to Rictus. Always ready to serve, came the reply. Really, said Harvey, stepping down off the chair and approaching the creature. Of course, always. Now he was closer to the man, Harvey saw the cracks in his veneer. You're afraid of me, aren't you? Harvey said. No, no, Rictus insisted. I'm respectful, that's all. Mr. Hood thinks you're a bright boy. He's instructed me to offer whatever you want to make you stay. The sky's the limit. You know what I want. Anything but the years. Thief, you can't have those. You won't even need them if you stay and become Mr. Hood's apprentice. You'll live forever, just like him. Think about it. You might be able to kill the likes of Karna, or me, but you'll never hurt Hood. He's too old, too wise, too dead. If I stayed, Harvey said, would the children in the lake go free? Why bother about them? Because one of them was my friend. You're thinking of little Lulu, aren't you? Rictus said. Well, let me tell you, she's very happy down there. They all are. No, they're not. The lake's foul and you know it. He took a step towards Rictus, who retreated as if in fear of his life. How would you like it, he said, living in the cold and the dark? You're right, said Rictus. Whatever you say... I say set them free now, and if you won't, then I will. He pushed Rictus aside and started down the stairs two at a time. He didn't have a clue what he was going to do when he got down to the lake. Fish were fish, after all, even if they'd once been children. But he was determined to somehow save them from Hood. Rictus came after him down the flight. What do you want, he said. 
Just imagine it and it's yours. How about your own motorcycle? As he spoke, something gleamed on the landing below, and the sleekest motorcycle human eyes had ever seen rolled into view. It's yours, my boy, Richter said. No thanks, Harvey said. I don't blame you, Richter said, kicking the motorcycle over as he sailed past it. How about books? Do you like books? Before Harvey could reply, the wall in front of him lifted like a great brick curtain, revealing shelf upon shelf of leather-bound volumes. The masterpieces of the world, Richter said, from Aristotle to Zola. No? No, said Harvey, hurrying on. There's got to be something you want, Richter said. They were heading towards the final flight of stairs now, and Rictus knew he didn't have very long before his prey was out in the open air. You like dogs, Rictus said, as the litter of yapping pups scampered up the stairs. Pick one! Hell, have them all! Harvey was tempted, but he stepped over them and on. Something more exotic, maybe, Rictus said, as a flock of brilliantly feathered parrots descended from the ceiling. Harvey waved them away. Too noisy, huh, said Rictus. You want something quiet and powerful? Tigers! That's what you want. Tigers! No sooner said than they padded into view in the hallway below. Two white tigers with eyes like polished gold. Nowhere to keep them, Harvey said. That's practical, Rictus conceded. I like a practical kid. As the tigers bounded off, the telephone on the table beside the kitchen door began to ring. Rictus was down the flight in two springs and at the table in another two. Listen to this, he said. It's the president. He wants to give a medal. No, he doesn't, Harvey said. He was at the bottom of the stairs and crossing to the front door. You're right, said Rictus, ear to the phone again. He wants to give you Alaska. Harvey kept walking. Too cold. He says, how about Florida? Too hot. Boy, you're a difficult guy to please, Harvey Swick. Harvey ignored him and turned the handle of the front door. Richter slammed down the phone and raced towards him. Wait up, he hollered. Wait up, I'm not done yet. You've got nothing I want, Harvey said, hauling open the door. They're all fakes. What if they are, said Rictus. So's the sun out there. You can still enjoy it. And let me tell you, it takes a lot of magic to conjure all those shams and hoaxes. Mr. Hood's really sweating to find you something you like. Ignoring him, Harvey stepped out onto the porch. Mrs. Griffin was standing on the lawn with Stew Cat in her arms, squinting up at the house. She smiled when she saw Harvey emerge. I heard such noises, she said. What's been going on in there? I'll tell you later. Where's Wendell? He wandered off, she said. Harvey cupped his hands around his mouth and yelled, Wendell! Wendell! His voice came back to him from the face of the house, but there was no reply from Wendell. It's a warm afternoon, said Rictus, idling on the porch. Maybe he went swimming. Oh, no, Harvey murmured. No, not Wendell. Please, not Wendell. Rictus shrugged. He was a goofy little kid anyhow. He'll probably look better as a fish. No, Harvey yelled up at the house. This isn't fair. You can't do this. You can't. Oh, to be a vampire again, Harvey thought. To have claws and fangs and a hunger for blood upon him. But he wasn't a beast. He was a boy. It was the vampire king who had the power, not him. And then, as he stared up at the house, he remembered something that Rictus had told him at the door. It takes a lot of magic to conjure those shams and hoaxes. Mr. Hood's really sweating to find you something you like. 
Maybe I don't need fangs to suck him dry, Harvey thought. Maybe all I need is wishes. I want to talk to Hood, he told Rictus. Why? Well, maybe there are some things I'd like. Only I want to tell him about them personally. He's listening, Rictus said, glancing back towards the house. Harvey scanned the windows and the eaves and the porch, but there was no sign of any presence. I don't see him, he said. Yes, you do, Rictus replied. Is he in the house, Harvey asked, staring through the open door. Haven't you guessed yet, Rictus replied. He is the house. As he spoke, a cloud moved over the sun. The roof and walls darkened, and the entire house seemed to swell like a monstrous fungus. It was alive, from the eaves to the foundations. Alive. Go on, Rictus said. Speak to him. He's listening. Harvey took a step towards the house. Can you hear me? He said. The front door swung a little wider, and a sighing breath from the top of the stairs blew a cloud of jive's dust out into the porch. He can hear you, said Rictus. If I stay, Harvey began. Yes, said the house, making the word from creaks and rattles. You'll give me anything I want? For a bright boy like you, anything. You promise? On your magic? I promise. I promise. Just say the word. Well, for a start... Yes? I lost my ark. Then you must have another. Bigger. Better. And aboard of the porch folded back as an ark, three times the size of the first one, rose into view. I don't want wooden animals, Harvey said as he walked towards the steps. What, then? What would you like? Harvey turned his back on the hood house and surveyed the lawn. The sight of Mrs. Griffin watching with puzzlement inspired the next request. I want flowers, he said. Everywhere, and I don't want two alike. The lawn began to tremble as though a minor earthquake were underway, and the next moment countless shoots pressed up between the blades of grass. Mrs. Griffin began to laugh with delight. Look at them, she said. Just look. It was quite a show. Tens of thousands of flowers bursting into blossom at the same time. Even though he knew it was all an illusion, Harvey was impressed and said so. Looks good, he told the hood house. Satisfied? Harvey simply said, we're getting there. Getting where? Well, said Harvey, I guess we'll know when we arrive. A low growl of irritation came from the house, shaking the windows. I'm going to have to be careful, Harvey thought. Hood's getting angry. Rictus echoed that thought. I hope you're not playing Mr. Hood along, he warned, because he doesn't like that kind of game. He wants me happy, doesn't he, Harvey said. Of course. So how about something to eat? The kitchen's full, said Rictus. I don't want pies and hot dogs. I want... He paused, ransacking his memory for delicacies he'd heard about. Roast swan, and oysters, and um, uh, those little black eggs. Um, caviar, said Rictus. That's it. I want caviar. Really? It's disgusting. I still want it. And frog's legs, and horseradish, and uh, pomegranates. 
The meals were already appearing in the hallway, plate upon steaming plate. Harvey rapidly began to exhaust his menu of real meals, however, so instead of giving the house easy recipes like meatballs and pizzas, he started to invent dishes. I want crawfish cooked in cherry soda and uh, horse steaks with jelly bean sauce and Boston cream cheese and pastrami soup. Wait, wait, said Rictus. You're going too fast. But Harvey didn't stop. And uh, pumpernickel stew and snail fudge with pig's foot clusters. Wait. This time, Harvey stopped. He saw all the dishes he demanded piled so high in the hallway that they were threatening to topple and float the ark on a noxious sea of sweet meats and stews. I know what you're doing. Uh-oh, Harvey thought. He's on to me. He looked up and saw that his plan to drain the house of its magic was indeed working. Many of the windows were now cracked or broken. The doors were peeling and hanging from their hinges. The porch boards were twisted and blighted. You're testing me, aren't you? Admit it, thief. Harvey took a deep breath, then said, If I'm going to be your apprentice, I need to know how powerful you are. Are you satisfied? Almost. What more do you want? What more indeed, Harvey thought. His mind was reeling with these ridiculous lists. He had little left in the way of demands. You may have one final gift. One final proof of my power. Then you must accept me as your master forever and ever. Agreed? Agreed, Harvey said. So tell me, what do you want? He looked at the ark, and at the flowers, and at the food spewing through the door. What should he demand? One final request to break Hood's back. But what? What? A gust of chilly wind came from the direction of the lake. Fall could not be far off. The season of dying things. I know, he said suddenly. Tell me. Tell me and let's have this game over once and for all. I want your bright soul under my wing, little thief. And I want the seasons, Harvey said. All the seasons at once. At once? Yes, at once. That's nonsensical. It's what I want. You said one more wish and that's it. Very well. I will give it to you. And when you have it, little thief, your soul is mine. Hood didn't waste any time. He'd no sooner made his final offer to Harvey than the balmy wind grew gusty, carrying off the lamb's wool clouds that had been drifting through the summer sky. In their place came a thunderhead the size of a mountain, which loomed over the house like a shadow thrown against heaven. It had more than lightning at its dark heart. Harvey planted his feet wide apart and resisted every blast and buffet, determined not to take shelter. This spectacle might be the last he set eyes upon as a free spirit. Indeed, as a living spirit. He intended to enjoy it. It was a sight to behold. To his left, shafts of sunlight pierced the storm clouds in the name of summer, only to be smothered by fall's fogs, while to his right, spring coaxed its legions out of bow on earth then saw its buds murdered by winter's frosts before they could show their colors. Soon all became confusion. Snows melted into rains as they fell. Rains were boiled into vapor, and somewhere in the midst of this chaos, the power that had brought it about raised its voice. Enough! 
Enough! The seasons raged on, tearing at the house which stood in the midst of their battlefield. The walls were thrown over by the raging wind. The chimneys were racked by thunder and toppled. The lightning rods struck so many times they melted and fell through the slateless roof in a burning rain, setting fire to every floorboard, banister, and stick of furniture they touched. The porch, pummeled by hail, was reduced to matchwood. The staircase collapsed like a tower of cards. Harvey witnessed all of this and rejoiced. Loud though the dins of wind and thunder were, they couldn't drown out the sound of the house as it perished and went to dust. The warring seasons turned to peace. The thunderhead softened its furies and dispersed. The wind dropped to an idling breeze. The fierce sun grew watery and veiled itself in mist. Oh, child, said Mrs. Griffin. Harvey turned to her. She was standing just a few yards from him, gazing up at the sky. She was watching a congregation of floating lights, the same that Harvey had seen Hood feeding upon in the attic, which had been freed by the collapse of the house. They were now moving in a steady stream towards the lake. The children's souls, she said. Beautiful. Her body was no longer solid, Harvey saw. She was fading away in front of him. Oh, no, he murmured. She took her eyes off the sky and stared down at her arms and the cat she was carrying in them. It, too, was growing insubstantial. Look at us, Mrs. Griffin said. It feels so wonderful. But you're disappearing. I've lingered here far too long, sweet boy. It's time to go. She kept stroking Stewcat as they both faded from sight. You are the brightest soul I ever met, Harvey Swick. Keep shining, won't you? Mrs. Griffin and Stewcat had no sooner vanished from sight than Harvey heard a voice calling his name. The air was still thick with dust, and he had to look hard for the speaker. Lulu? Who else? she said. The lake's dark water still soaked her from head to foot, but as it ran from her body into the ground, her silver scales went with it. When she opened her arms to him, they were human arms. You're free, he said. I can't believe you're free. We're all free, she said, and glanced back toward the lake. An extraordinary sight met Harvey's eyes. A procession of laughing children coming towards him through the mist. Those closest to him were returned to their human shape. Those behind still shaking off their fishiness, step by step. We should all get out of here, Harvey said, looking towards the wall. I don't think we'll have any trouble getting through the mist now. One of the children behind Lulu had spotted a box of clothes in the rubble of the house, and announcing his find to the rest, stumbled through the debris to find something to wear. Lulu left Harvey's side to join the search, but not before she'd planted a kiss on his cheek. Don't expect one from me said a voice out of the dust, and Wendell stepped into view, beaming from ear to ear. What did you do, Harvey? Pull the place down brick by brick? <laughs> Something like that, said Harvey, unable to conceal his pride. There was a roaring sound from the direction of the lake. What's that? Harvey wanted to know. The water's disappearing, Wendell said. Where to? Wendell shrugged. Who cares? Maybe it's all being sucked to hell. Eager to witness this, Harvey walked towards the lake and through the clouds of dirt saw that it had indeed become a whirlpool. What happened to Hood, by the way? Wendell wanted to know. He's gone, said Harvey. They've all gone. Even as the words left his lips, a voice said, Not quite. 
he turned from the waters, and there in the rubble stood Rictus. His fine jacket was torn, and his face was white with dust. He looked like a clown, a laughing clown. Now why would I take myself off, he said. We never said goodbye. Harvey stared at him. I know what you're thinking, said Rictus, reaching into his pocket. You're wondering why I'm not dead and gone. Well, I'll tell you. I did some planning ahead. He drew a glass globe, which flickered as though it held a dozen candle flames out of his pocket. I stole a little piece of the old man's magic, just in case he ever got tired of me and tried to put me out of my misery. <laughs> Rictus lifted the globe up to his leering face. I've got power enough here to keep me going for years and years. Long enough to build a new house and take over where Hood left off. Oh, don't look so unhappy, kid. I got a place for you right here. He slapped his thigh. You can be my bird dog. I'll send you out looking for kitty winkies to bring home to Uncle Rictus. He slapped his thigh a second time. Come on, don't waste my time now. I don't... He stopped there, his gaze dropping to the rubble at his feet. Oh, no, I beg. Before he could finish his plea, a hand with foot-long fingers reached up from the rubble and snatched hold of his throat, dragging him down into the dirt in one swift motion. Mine! Mine! It was Hood, Harvey knew. No other voice on earth cut so deep. Rictus struggled in his creator's grip, digging in the debris for some weapon, but none came to hand. The magic's yours! I was holding it for you! Liar! I was! I swear! Give it to me, then! Where shall I put it? Rictus said. Hood's hand loosened him a little, and he managed to haul himself to his knees. Right here! Hood said, hanging on to Rictus's collar by his littlest digit, while his forefinger pointed down towards the rubble. Pour it into the ground! But into the ground! Rictus pressed the globe between his palms, and it shattered like a sphere of spun sugar its bright contents running out between his palms and into the ground in front of him. There was a moment of silence, then a tremor ran through the rubble. Hood's finger let its captive slip, and Rictus hurriedly got to his feet. Pieces of timber and stone instantly moved over the heaps of rubble towards the spot where he'd poured the magic, several lifted high into the air. All Rictus could do was cover his head as the hail increased. Harvey was clear of this flying debris and might well have made a retreat. But if he fled now, he knew his business with Hood would never be finished. He didn't have to wait long for Hood's next move. The hand holding Rictus's neck suddenly loosened him and in a flash was gone from sight. The following moment, the ground gaped and a form climbed out of its tomb in the rubble. Rictus let out a cry of horror, but before he could retreat, the figure reached for him and, turning to face Harvey, held his traitorous servant high. Here, at last, was the evil that had built the holiday house, shaped more or less as a man. It was not made of flesh, blood, and bone, however. In the high times of his evil, Hood had been the house. 
Now it was the other way around. The house, what was left of it, had become Mr. Hood. His eyes were made of broken mirrors and his face of gouged stone. He had a mane of splinters and limbs of timber. He had shattered slates for teeth and rusty screws for fingernails and a cloak of rotted drapes that scarcely hid the darkness of his heart from sight. So, thief, he said, ignoring Rictus's pitiful struggles. You see me as the man I was, or rather as a copy of that man. Is it what you expected? Yes, Harvey said. It's exactly what I expected. Oh? You're dirt and muck and bits and pieces, Harvey said. You're nothing. Nothing, am I? Nothing? Ha! I'll show you, thief. I'll show you what I am. <laughs> Let me kill him for you, Rictus gasped. You needn't bother. I'll do it. You brought him here, Hood said, turning his splintered eyes on his servant. You're to blame. He's just a boy. I can deal with him. Just let me do it. Let me... Before Rictus could finish, Hood took hold of his servant's head and with one short motion simply twisted it off. A yellowish cloud of foul-smelling air rose from the severed neck, and Rictus, the last of Hood's abominable quartet, perished. Now, thief, you will see the power. His mane of splinters stood on end as though ready to pierce Harvey's heart. His mouth grew wide as a tunnel, and a blast of sour, icy air rose from his belly. Come closer, he roared, opening his arms. The rags that clung there billowed and spread like the wings of some ancient vampire. Come, or must I come for you? Not even certain what direction he was taking, Harvey turned on his heels and ran as another blast of soul-freezing air struck him. The ground was treacherous, slippery and strewn with rubble. He fell and glanced back to see Hood descending upon him with a vengeful shriek. He hauled himself to his feet, Hood's rusted nails missing him by a whistling inch when he heard Lulu calling his name. He veered in the direction of her voice, but Hood caught him by the collar of his jacket. Got you, little thief. Before Hood could catch better hold, however, Harvey threw back his arms and pitched himself forward. Off came the jacket, and he made a third dash for freedom, his eyes fixed on Lulu, who was beckoning him towards her. She was standing on the edge of the lake, perched inches from the spinning waters. Surely she didn't imagine they could escape into the lake. The vortex would tear them limb from limb. We can't, he yelled. We must, she yelled back. It's the only way. He was within three strides of her now. He could see her bare feet slithering and sliding on the slimy rock as she fought to keep her balance. He reached out for her, but her eyes weren't on him. They were on the monster at his back. Lulu, he yelled, don't look. But her gaze was fixed upon Hood, her mouth agape, and Harvey couldn't help but glance back to see what fascinated her so. Hood's pursuit had thrown his coat of rags into disarray, and there was something between its folds, he saw, darker than any night sky or lightless cellar. What was it? The essence of his magic, perhaps, guarding his loveless heart? Do you give up? Hood said, driving Harvey back into the rocks beside Lulu. Surely you would not choose the vortex over me. Go, 
Harvey murmured to Lulu, his gaze still fixed on the mystery beneath Hood's coat. He felt her hand grasp his for a moment. It's the only way, she said. Then her fingers were gone, and he was standing on the rocks alone. If you choose the flood, you will die horribly. It will spin you apart. Whereas I... He extended an inviting hand to Harvey, stepping up onto the rock as he did so. I offer you an easy death, rocked to sleep on a bed of illusions. Choose. Out of the corner of his eye, Harvey glimpsed Lulu. She had not fled, as he'd thought. She'd simply gone to find a weapon. And she had one. A piece of timber dragged out of the rubble. It would be precious little use against Hood's enormity, Harvey knew, but he was glad not to be alone in these last moments. He looked up at Hood's face. Maybe I should sleep, he said. The Vampire King smiled. Wise little thief, he replied, opening his arms to invite the boy into his shadow. Harvey took a step over the rock towards Hood, raising his hand as he did so. His face was reflected in the shattered mirrors of the vampire's eyes. Two thieves in one head. Sleep! But Harvey had no intention of sleeping yet. Before Hood could stop him, he grabbed hold of the creature's coat and pulled. The scraps came away with a wet tearing sound, and Hood let out a howl of rage. There was no great enchantment at his heart. In fact, there was no heart at all. There was only a void, neither cold nor hot, living nor dead, not made of mystery, but of nothingness. The illusionist's illusion. Furious. Hood let out another roar and reached down to reclaim the rags of his coat from the thief's hands. Harvey took a quick step backwards, avoiding the fingers by a whisker. Hood came raging after him, leaving Harvey no choice but to retreat another step until he had nowhere to go but the flood. Again, Hood snatched at the filched rags and would have had both coat and thief in one fatal grasp had Lulu not run at him from behind, swinging the timber like a baseball bat. She struck the back of Hood's knee so hard her weapon shattered, the impact pitching her to the ground. The blow was not without effect, however. It threw Hood off balance and he flailed wildly. Give me my coat, thief! It's all yours, Harvey yelled, and tossed the stolen rags toward the waters. Hood lunged after them, and as he did so, Harvey flung himself back toward solid ground. He heard Hood shriek behind him and turned to see the Vampire King, the rags in his fist, pitch headfirst into the frenzied waters. Thief! Help me, and I'll give you the world! Forever and ever! Then the ferocity of the waters began to rip at his makeshift body, tearing out his nails and rattling out his teeth, washing away his mane of splinters and shaking his limbs apart at the joints. He was drawn into the white waters at the whirlpool's heart and shrieking with rage went where all evil must go at last, into nothingness. On the shore, Harvey put his arms around Lulu, laughing and sobbing at the same time. <laughs> we did it, he said. Did what, said a voice at their backs, and they looked round to see Wendell. What's been going on, he wanted to know. What are you laughing at? What are you crying for? He looked beyond Harvey and Lulu, in time to see the last fragments of Hood's body disappear with a fading howl. And what was that, he demanded. Harvey wiped the tears from his cheeks. Who cares, he said.
The wall of mist still hovered at the edge of Hood's domain, and it was there that the survivors gathered to say their farewells. The first of the children were already braving the wall of mist. Wendell said to Harvey, If time is set to rights out there, then I'm going back a few more years than you. That's true. If we meet again, I'm going to be a lot older. You may not even know me. I'll know you. Promise? I promise. With that, they shook hands, and Wendell made his departure into the mist. Have you ever wanted two things at the same time? Lulu asked Harvey. But you knew you couldn't have both of them? Once or twice. Why? Because I'd like to grow up with you and be your friend. But I also want to go home. And I think in the year that's waiting for me on the other side of that wall, you haven't even been born. Harvey nodded sadly, glancing back towards the ruins. I guess we do have one thing to thank Hood for. What's that? We were children together, at least for a little while. Lulu tried to smile, but her eyes were full of tears. So let's go together as far as we can, Harvey said. Yes, I'd like that, Lulu replied, and hand in hand they walked towards the wall. Before the mist eclipsed them, they looked at each other. Home, said Harvey. Then they stepped into the wall. He woke in darkness, and for one heart-stopping moment, he thought the Black Lake had claimed him after all, and he was down in its depths, a prisoner. Crying out in terror, he sat up, and to his infinite relief saw the window at the bottom of his bed, the curtains slightly parted, and heard the light patter of rain upon the sill. He was home. The sound of two familiar voices drifted up from the bottom of the stairs. At the bottom of the stairs, Harvey halted, a little afraid to face the truth. Had anything changed, or were the two people just out of sight still old and frail? He went to the door and pushed it open. His mom and dad were standing with their backs to him at the window, staring out at the rain. Hello, he said. They both turned at the same moment, and Harvey let out a whoop of joy. Here was his prize, his mother and father looking just the way they had before Rictus had come for him. The stolen years were back where they belonged, in his possession. I'm a good thief, he said half to himself. Oh, my darling, said his mom, coming to him with open arms. He hugged her first, then his dad. What have you been up to, son? His dad wanted to know. I'm, I was just wandering around, and I got lost. I didn't mean to get you upset. I think you owe both of us the truth, Harvey, his mom said. We want to know everything. Everything? Everything, said his dad. So he told them the whole tale, right from the beginning. And if their expressions had been doubtful last time he'd related his adventures, they were incredulous now. Do you really expect us to believe all of this? His father broke in while Harvey was talking about meeting Hood in the attic. I can take you to the house, Harvey said, or what's left of it. I couldn't find it last time because it hid itself from grown-ups, but Hood's gone, so there's no magic left. If you can find this hood house, his father said, we'd like to see it. They set out early the following day, and this time, just as Harvey had expected, the way back to the house was not concealed by magic. He found the streets that Rictus had first led him along easily enough, and very soon the gentle slope on which the house had once stood came into view. That's it, he said. The house stood there. It's just a hill, Harvey, his dad said. It all looks rather pretty, his mom said, as they came to the place where the mist wall had stood. Harvey went down on his haunches and dug at the dirt with his bare hands. The ground was soft and gave off the sweet smell of fertility. Strange, isn't it? said a voice. 
Harvey looked up, his fists full of dirt. A man a little older than his father was standing a few yards from him, smiling. What are you talking about, Harvey said. The flowers, the ground. Maybe the earth has its own magic. Good magic, I mean. And it's buried Hood's memory forever. You know about Hood, Harvey said. The man nodded. Oh, yes. What exactly do you know, Harvey's mom asked. Our son here's been telling us such strange stories. They're all true. You haven't even heard them, Harvey's dad replied. You should trust your boy. I have it on the best authority that he's a hero. Really? said Harvey's dad. Were you one of Hood's prisoners? Not me, the man said. Then how do you know? The man glanced over his shoulder, and there at the bottom of the slope stood a woman in a white dress. Harvey studied this stranger, trying to make out her face, but her wide-brim hat kept her in shadow. He started to get to his feet, intending to take a closer look, but the man said, Don't. Please. She, uh, sent me in her place just to say hello. She remembers you the way you are. Uh, young, that is, and she'd like you to remember her the same way. Lulu, Harvey murmured. The man neither confirmed nor denied this. He simply said to Harvey, I'm uh, much obliged to you, young man. I, uh, I hope to be as fine a husband to her as you were a friend. Husband? Harvey mouthed. How time flies, the man said, consulting his watch. We're late for lunch. Um, may I shake your hand, young sir? It's dirty, Harvey warned. What could be better between us, the man replied with a smile, than this healing earth? He took Harvey's hand shook it, and with a nod to Harvey's mom and dad, hurried back down the slope. Harvey watched as he spoke to the woman in the white dress. He saw her nod, saw her smile in his direction. Then they were both gone, out into the street, and away. Well, said Harvey's dad, it seems your Mr. Hood existed after all. So you believe me. Something happened here, and you were a hero. I believe that. Then that's enough, said Harvey's mom. You don't have to keep digging, sweetie. Whatever's under there should stay buried. Harvey was about to empty his hand of dirt when his dad said, Let me have that, and opened his hand. Really, said Harvey. I've heard a little good magic's always useful, came his father's reply. Isn't that right? Harvey smiled and poured a fistful of earth into his father's palm. Always, he said. The days that followed were unlike any Harvey had ever known. Time would be precious from now on. It would tick by, of course, as it always had, but Harvey was determined he wouldn't waste it with sighs and complaints. He'd fill every moment with the seasons he'd found in his heart. Hopes like birds on a spring branch. Happiness like a warm summer sun. Magic like the rising mists of fall. And best of all, love. Love enough for a thousand Christmases.